Committee on day three of a markup of a climate change bill. That's when members make line-by-line -line changes to legislation. Chairman Henry Waxman says he plans for the committee to finish work on the bill this week. You're watching live Thank coverage you, on C-SPAN 2. Thank you, Mr. Pitt. Uh, Ms. Eshoo, I, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, Mr. Barton said he didn't uh, think he could support your amendment. That would mean, after debate, we'd go to a vote on your amendment. Uh, but we're waiting for uh, members to return. We indicated there would be no votes before 8.30, but that's only seven minutes away. There are people at the White House who want to be here and we want to have here, on both sides of the aisle, uh, to uh, respond to any vote because, um, uh, uh, it, to be fair, and so we are waiting for them to return. But I think uh, that uh, we ought to have a, a Republican amendment to Title III, and I was informed that Mr. Murphy has a, a, an amendment to Title III that uh, would engender a great deal of debate. I don't know if yours would engender that much debate. It seems to me your amendment is a pretty straightforward one, and I don't know why it wouldn't be accepted just on a voice vote. But on the other hand, uh, the rules that the Republican leader on the committee have set for us is that if there is an amendment that they don't find acceptable, they want to have a roll call vote. And we're not ready to go to a roll call vote. So what I'm saying is uh, that I, I wish Mr. Murphy would arrive as and he is on his way. So w w let's sit tight for a minute. And uh, the gentleman um, has some questions he wishes to ask. Well, then why don't I recognize you for uh, five minutes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to counsel, and again, I just want to try to understand. This is, uh, again, the bill, the bill form on page 437, line 8. Uh, entitled the Minim Minimum Strategic Reserve Auction Price in Subsequent Years. I, uh, yes. First of all, could you describe what, a, what the Minimum Strategic Reserve Auction Price, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, Strategic Reserve Auction is? The, the bill would set aside a number of allowances in the Strategic Reserve it specifies the percentage that will be drawn, uh, that, that will, that the number and the percentage that will be put into the strategic reserve. And then quarterly, there is an auction of a specified number of allowances from the reserve. And, and what might an allowance be? Or what, what might go into the strategic reserve? What is it? Is it a metric ton of something? Is it a, it, it's, it's some quantity of some. It's allowances rate. that go into the reserve. And who establishes what that allowance is? Uh, section 720 um, section 721 establishes what the allowances are okay and and those allowances are things that have been established by the government as some entity that would qualify for an allowance is that correct it, under the it, law the I'm sorry I couldn't hear what you were saying that that that, that the panel the government decides what quantity or what is what would qualify as a quantity to uh, relate to an allowance that could be put into the reserve. So it's, it establishes what that quantity of whatever it is. The, an, an allowance is the authorization to emit one ton of carbon dioxide okay, equivalent. That was, the, that was the point where I was getting to. Good. And in, in this particular case, it says the auction price shall be 60 percent above a rolling 36-month average. Help me understand what that means. That, that means the administrator would look at what the average price of allowances had been over the three-year period or 36-month period leading up to the auction, and then the average of that price would be the minimum floor price or the reserve price for the auction. Plus 60 percent. Plus 60 percent, yes. And why 60 percent? I don't understand that. That the statute sets 60 percent uh, above the average price as, and, as the floor price for the reserve. And the average price would be determined by the auction or is it determined by trading of that particular? It's the uh, 
it's the 36 month average of the daily closing price for that year's emission allowance vintage as reported in on registered carbon trading facilities All right. so, calculated using cost. So this dollars. is now a commodity trade. So Wall Street is trading the value of this metric ton. Is that correct? The, the, the That's how that would work. Allowances may be traded. Okay. So uh, just so some financial market, I, I'll say Wall Street trades this metric ton, and over 36 months they affix a value to that on by average. So every day, one day it's $100, next day it's $90, right? And, it's, it's right. and after that's over, then they say we're going to put more into the market, but they have to be sold for 60 percent. So who buys them at at that 60 percent rate? The, the strategic reserve uh, auctions can only be accessed by covered entities. So a company who, say, is, is for whatever reason, is, it needs to buy these credits means they could grow. They hired 100 new employees. They're growing. They're, they're outside their emissions. They have to go to the strategic re reserve. No, they, they have other places that they can go. They can, uh, some of them may be given allowances for free under Section 782. I understand, but so some who, may so buy who, who would credits. buy these 60 percent? That's what I don't understand. The gentleman yield to me. Yes, please. Yeah, this is a, this is a safety valve in the market because if the, um, the value of an allowance went uh, too high, uh, there could be an uh, increase in the supply by the release of the uh, allowances that are, are, or the offsets that would then be made available. Uh, th this is a, uh, an interesting and I thought quite innovative approach. As, as you may know, the U.S. Climate Action Partnership worked for over two and a half years in developing the idea of how this would work. These are the people who have to live with it. And they wanted to be sure that they weren't put in a situation where there could be any manipulation of the market, since they're the ones who have to buy uh, uh, the allotments. So they uh, established a mechanism for an increase of supply when the demand is uh, uh, high enough so that otherwise it would drive up the price. Now, uh, in addition to that, we adopted uh, in the, and put into the base bill language offered by uh, Mr. Bart Stupak, our colleague, who's done a great deal of work on market manipulation. And uh, he uh, put in provisions, recommended that we put in provisions that have even stronger enforcement powers to make sure that there's no, no manipulation in the market. But your question was what, uh, why the extra uh, 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 offsets uh, would be added to the allowances, and that is a way to hold down the cost. The whole system is to provide a mechanism for achieving the reductions in carbon emissions at the lowest possible price and to avoid any manipulation of the market. Uh, the, uh, the, the structure was uh, calibrated uh, to provide a, an equilibrium so when you talk about a 30-month average of the price over a period of time, you're not dealing with any aberration. You're balancing it out. But then if it indicates a trend, the, the, the uh, demand could be uh, met with a, uh, a greater supply. And, and, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. Maybe you can help me further understand. It says a minimum strategic reserve auction price. So if you're that person who has to buy in that particular year, you've lost all the advantage of the market that you say has. And now I pay 60 percent higher than the market says is that no, I, I, commodity I, is always right here. The gentleman's time has expired. But I do think that there are protections that are written in so that uh, people can be, uh, 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 there, there's a banking system where they can use allotments that they've saved for this kind of purpose. You know, you get an allotment, you don't use it unless you have to. And you don't have to use it because there are other ways of achieving the reductions that are going to be more cost effective. The unintended consequences may be this, is, this punishes those companies who are growing and now have to pay a higher price for the same commodity I, I, over the 36 I, I, month I, average. I, I beg it says right here on page 437. It says that it punishes companies? Absolutely. The minimum strategic reserve auction price shall be, shall be 60 percent above a rolling 36 month average. Yes. They've lost all the benefit yes. of the three years. No, I, I, I disagree with you. I don't think that's what it means at all. But you've exceeded the time by uh, almost uh, two and a half minutes, and Mr. Murphy has arrived, so I want to recognize him at this point to be able to offer his amendment. We can get into uh, amendments and get uh, uh, moving on this uh, markup process so thank that we Chairman. can consider uh, different alternatives. But, but thank you for your questions. I think they were very provo provocative.
Uh, Mr. Murphy, you have an amendment at the desk? I have an amendment at the desk which meets all of your requirements, sir. Uh, clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Page 732, after line 17, insert the following Thank new section and make the necessary Without objection, the changes. amendment will be considered as read. Gentlemen, be recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Chairman, in this, in the final sentence, there's a typo. It, it has the word secretary. It should be administrator, referring to the administrator of the EPA as was in the Do you wish to ask unanimous you consent? You ask unanimous consent that that be. Without uh, objection, that will be the order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this bill we reviewed has been something that people have debated whether it's going to cost more in energy taxes or groceries or clothes or their cars. Now, if we can't guarantee we won't see higher energy prices or higher gasoline prices or higher home electricity costs, let's at least guarantee we're not going to lose jobs. We've seen the ads on TV lately saying that we're going to see some growth in green jobs, and that's good. But let's not lose sight or concern for the jobs that have been so important to our nation for so long, in particular, steel. Now, we're proud of steel in Pittsburgh. We're proud that our steel has built the skyscrapers in New York City, that magnificent gateway arch in St. Louis and the picturesque Golden Gate Bridge, all made by Pittsburgh steel workers. But throughout America, American steel has been the arsenal of democracy and the foundation of our nation's strength. But in the 1970s and 1980s, we saw steel jobs decline. Tens of thousands of jobs left the United States, not because the world no longer needed steel, but because the world wanted less expensive steel. And since 1974, America has lost 367,000 steel jobs. So steel mills open up all around the world where countries made steel and steel products with lower wages, low benefits, lower and non-existent pollution standards, and lots of government subsidies from foreign governments. Over and over we fought for American-made steel, and over and over we all went to rallies and stood up for steel. I'm sure many in this room spoke up at those rallies and told the crowds we were with them. We pledged to all those worried workers we would no longer stand by and watch other nations take our jobs. We promised. We promised we would never let them down. We promised we would not, less US pol would not let U.S. policy weaken our own competitiveness. Many of us introduced bills to impose tariffs against countries that illegally dump steel in the United States. Many of us spoke out against the inferior products made in other nations and sent to our shores. Many have signed on as co-sponsors to legislation recently introduced by Congressman Tim Ryan and myself to stop any nation from illegal currency manipulation so we could level the playing field for steel and protect American workers. We all spoke out in church halls and fire halls and labor halls that we would push for fair trade and oppose any and all policies by the United States or other countries to put us, our families, our workers at a competitive disadvantage. Well, now it's time to put our promises to work and it's time to make good on our pledges. We've lost too many jobs in America to even risk losing more, and the bleeding must stop. Back when thousands of those steel jobs were disappearing in the United States, I remember working as a psychologist in Pittsburgh and having counseled so many of those families, families that were so stressed by difficulty paying bills, threatened marriages, kids having trouble in school. I remember telling one family they didn't need a doctor, they needed jobs. Now, we're all for doing many things to clean up our air. We have to conserve, not waste energy. We have to use every ounce of innovation and creativity to maximize our energy efficiency and alternate energy development. But we must also explore those resources we have now, such as oil and coal, and put them to work. We must crack the scientific codes to solve our problems of pollution and emissions, solve our problems with real science, not political science. We can do this with Republicans and Democrats standing together. That's why Representatives Neil Abercrombie, Lee Terry, Jim Costa, Joe Wilson, Tim Walsh, Shelley Moore Capito, and I wrote and introduced a bill, H.R. 2227, the American Conservation and Clean Energy Independence Act, to cut our dependence on foreign oil, explore our own resources, but to dedicate the revenues to build clean coal plants, nuclear power plants, clean up our nation's water pollution, uh, broken sewer systems, our streams, our rivers, and our coasts. By contrast, the bill before us doesn't put much money at all into clean coal, not even enough to build a fraction of a plant. Our current plants are old, built at a time when they use slide rules, not computers. We can't rebuild America by a complicated system of taxes, trades, rebates, and exemptions to special interests, but we can embark on the largest building of our infrastructure in our history by using resources from oil and gas and coal to clean our air, land, and water. We can create jobs to raise families comfortably, jobs here in the USA, jobs that don't send money to foreign countries. I want everyone to stop and think about those rallies for jobs that we've all been to, 
Look into the eyes of American workers. Think about the rough hands and broad shoulders of America's makers of steel and say to them, when you needed us, we were here for you. Let's tell them we weren't just putting a cap on emissions. We were willing to put a cap on American job losses. Let's stand up for American steel. Let us say that at this time, this important, essential, pivotal time in our history, that when America was worried about jobs to feed their families, clothe their kids, and send their sons and daughters off to school, we stood by to their sides and said, America, we are here to ensure we will not abandon our workers again. We're here to stand up for steel, cap the job losses, and keep America strong. I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, chair represents, uh, recognizes Mr. Doyle. Speak uh, on thank, the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, is this for comment on the Murphy Amendment? Yes, we're, we're debating the Murphy Amendment. It's thank been you. presented to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd just like to make some comments uh, about what we've tried to do in this bill uh, to make sure that we don't lose jobs uh, in the steel industry. And I'd like to start uh, by quoting a letter that was sent to us uh, by the international president of the United Steelworkers Union, Leo Girard, who represents uh, all of the steelworkers that Mr. Murphy talks about uh, and, and, and that mostly reside in the 14th Congressional District where we have uh, U.S. Steel's two active steel plants, Edgar Thompson and Braddock, and Mon Valley Works in, in West Mifflin. Uh, this is from the International President of Steelworkers. Leo Girard, International President of the United Steelworkers Union, today praised the progress made by the U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee in its work to pass comprehensive climate change legislation with the following statement. The USW has been working to ensure that the new products and processes which will build the clean energy economy and solve the challenge of climate change are created here in the United States and built by American workers. We believe that addressing climate change and ensuring the strength of our nation's manufacturing sec sector can be compatible goals. We are grateful for the leadership shown on this critical issue by the members of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, particularly Chairman Waxman and Markey and Representatives Doyle and Inslee. I'm pleased that they, along with many stakeholders in the labor, business, and environmental communities, have reached consensus on a way forward that balances the need to address climate change with the need to ensure that U.S. workers and industries are not unfairly hurt in the process. By providing rebates to energy intensive manufacturers based on their output and efficiency, the House has created a strong incentive to maintain or increase domestic production and to improve efficiency in the process. These rebates ensure that all of those producers at or above the industry average efficiency are not penalized. Also, the rebates will remain in place at their full level until either a strong and enforceable global ag agreement has been reached or until the U.S. implements a program to equalize carbon costs between domestic and foreign producers. The combination of rebates and international programs will ensure continued domestic competitiveness and reduce the potential that our efforts in the U.S. to combat greenhouse gases will be more than offset by the increases elsewhere in the world. Preventing this carbon emissions leakage is critical if the goal of stopping climate change is to be met. Congressman Waxman and Markey, Congressman Doyle and Inslee, and the rest of the Energy and Commerce Committee realize this fundamental fact and have crafted a strong and flexible policy to prevent it. This, Mr. Chairman, from the International President of the United Steelworkers Union, uh, I think it is quite clear in this bill that the members of this committee have worked hard to ensure that no harm is done to our carbon intensive industry that have trade competition. The, this is a bill that will create jobs. Every wind turbine that we build in the United States uses 200 tons of steel. I can tell you the steel workers that reside in my district, and they all reside in my district, are looking forward to building those wind turbines using that 200 tons of steel. The grid, the transmission grid, that's going to have to be built to transmit the solar energy and the wind energy all across this country is going to be built by U.S. workers 
in the steel industry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it's pretty clear from this letter from the United Steelworkers Union that the people who work in steel and the people who represent those that work in steel uh, think that we've done a pretty good job in protecting their interests and protecting our jobs here in America. And, and I use the gentleman balance yield? of my Will time. Yeah, I'm sorry? Will the gentleman yield? Who is asking me to yield? Yes, I will, Mr. Gingrey. I, I appreciate the gentleman yielding, and I. What's that? Gentleman certainly has done a, a fantastic job of trying to preserve jobs and mitigate uh, the losses in his district, and he, and he and he talks about that letter, and they're uh, duly praising him. But I have, Mr. Speaker, I have, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, here a report from the uh, Heritage Foundation. Uh, talking about uh, some of the job losses in specific uh, districts of members of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, and and uh, Mr. Doyle, in, in your 14th of Pennsylvania, uh, the Heritage Foundation estimates 4,977 jobs lost in the year. Well, reclaiming my time, Mr. Gingrey, yeah. in Pittsburgh, we don't care much what the Heritage Foundation says. We well, care in, what the in Georgia, Steelworkers we don't care president much says about the because United we know who has the interest of workers in Pittsburgh, and it's not the Heritage Foundation. G gentleman's time has expired. Who seeks recognition on the Murphy Amendment? <laughs> yes, Ms. gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. And Actually, I, I do have great respect for Mike Doyle, and I, I know he's worked hard to craft this. I would just ask, uh, Mike, uh, just one question. What if, the, um, what if the General Secretary of the United Steel Workers is wrong? I mean, I mean what, if, what if he's wrong? What if there is great job loss? Well, I, I would just say to my friend that, that any time that you embark on something new and bold, and challenging from the future. You know, when, when the president said that we we're going to put a man on the moon and nobody ha knew how to do that, a lot of people thought maybe he was crazy at the time or maybe he was wrong. Uh, there's no guarantees in life, John. Um, I get it. But, I, but what I, I'm I, saying is, is we've crafted a bill uh, yeah, to deal with these situations. Yeah, and I'm just saying it's not, it's, it's still patriotic t to, to not believe in the product ad advertising of a bill that's going to raise the price of electricity and energy because you're monetizing carbon. So what we've been trying to do is say when you're going to raise energy costs, manufacturing is going to be harmed. You have negotiated diligently to try to offset that. Now, we're, we're going to find out if this bill ever becomes law, we'll find out who's right and who's wrong. I hope you're right. I fear you're wrong. And if you're wrong, all we're saying is there ought to be an insurance policy. So all these amendments are trying to, to say that if we have great job leakage, which means job loss, we better stop. We, we better, as Ch Chairman Waxman said, we, uh, to uh, Mr. Squeeze, we better stop digging the hole. And that's why we're, we're never going to come to agreement. But I, I think our votes are always going to be, for the most part, to say, if, if you have bet wrong, our insurance policy is we're going to have an opportunity with, with our votes to say, $5 gas is too high, we better change course. This amount of job loss is too much, we better change course. There's no insurance policy in, in this bill unless through the process we amend it and perfect it. And I, I mean, you, you know we have great respect for you well, and your well, work. My friend, you'll, I would. I, I, and I, I hear what you're saying. And you know, if, if I'm wrong or if, if you're wrong, John, we don't suffer too much. Um, if Leo's wrong, uh, this, this, is, this is his membership. Uh, this is his life. Uh, these are his brothers and sisters. Uh, I think that he's thought very long and hard, and he asked very tough questions as we sat down and talked about how do we craft this bill in a way that helps them. Uh, he has a lot to lose if he's wrong. Uh, the fact that he has faith right. in what we're trying to do, I think, gives this the credibility that you and I could never give it. But, but I will tell you, going back to the experience that I saw in southern Illinois with the mine workers, the mine workers, after the last Clean Air Act amendments, 
the politicians were there fighting for their jobs, the mine was still closed. And we'll have a chance to talk about mine worker jobs. So I, I have uh, a great fear that we, yeah, on this, this is. I, I know the uh, Harvard educated I, Wall Street trader who's the mayor of I, that town. I, I know that you yeah. like to put this, your mine workers up there. These are my steel workers. Okay. The gentleman yield. And, and uh, I, I, they're some of the best in the world. And, yeah, and I know the Harvard educated mayor who looks like a steel mill worker gentleman who's yield. the mayor. I would like to yield to my uh, colleague and friend, Mr. Murphy from Pennsylvania. I, I, I like that's your baseball team this year. That you're I like to also <laughs> talk about. <laughs> Many of these steel workers also live in the 18th Congressional District. And I want to point out this chart here, if I could. This has to do with the amount of emissions that come from different countries, China, European Union, Japan, and the United States. The U.S. makes steel efficiently uh, and also makes the least amount of emissions compared to these other things. Now, I want to say that this is not just the blast furnaces, which is here in this purple color, but also electric arc furnaces, which use massive amounts of electricity to melt their steel. And we, are, we do know the electric costs are going to go up. I also want to note that the Steel Manufacturers Association are also deeply concerned about this bill. We all are. Look, in 1974, we had 521,000 jobs in steel. We have 150-some thousand now or less. Uh, and our steel production has been there. We, well, let's, let's give a guarantee to these steel workers. I think the world of Leo Girard, too. He's a good man. And the steel workers are great people. Why not give them an insurance policy? I go back. Time has expired. The chairman would like to recognize himself for five minutes. I think that uh, when we ask each other, do we know w whether we're going to be right or wrong and what we're trying to accomplish, I think we ought to ask ourselves, are we, are we better off now? We have an 8.9 percent unemployment rate right now. 13.7 million Americans unemployed last month. Steel workers have been using, losing their jobs for years. And for those who want to question whether the, the uh, bill that the Steel Workers Union and the steel industry are supporting uh, are wrong, I think they have to answer back to you, were you right in backing the Bush administration in allowing so many of these jobs to leave? Were you right? in backing the Bush administration not to regulate the market so we wouldn't see the abuses that we now see? Will the chairman yield? No, I'm not going to yield yet. NAFTA? I voted against NAFTA. How did you vote? I wasn't here, but President Clinton signed it into law. Well, I must tell you this. Most of the votes for NAFTA were Republican votes. Except for the Democrats. Voted. Most of the votes for NAFTA were Republican votes. There are a lot of people, especially Republicans, some Democrats as well, believe that the doctrine of free trade would work out for everybody's benefit. There might be some steel workers who'd lose their jobs, but they're going to have other jobs they can turn to. And nobody's ever admitted that was not in the interest of the steel workers. So when, when you ask, it, is this worth trying out, this legislation that we're now uh, reviewing? Well, is the alternative to go back to where we are now? The where we've been, to have the kind of uh, policies we've had in this country, not just in trade, but policies that eviscerated the regulatory agencies to protect workers on job safety, to even increase the minimum wage, which we had a very difficult time because the President Bush would not accept it for such a very long period of time. The amendment that's being offered says, if it doesn't work out for the steel workers, if there are more job losses, well, specifically more than 10,000 jobs been lost in the steel industry, that the title will no longer cease to have any force and effect. If that happens, you're back now to where we are today. Is that a successful place to be? Uh, I don't think that that would be the right answer. If the, if, the, if the policy is not working out, then we're going to have to come up with another policy, not the failed policies that we've seen that have cost so many steel workers jobs, have moved so many industries overseas. So I, I, uh, I know you're sincere. On the other hand, it's hard to not recognize a pattern. If this happens, the bill's gone.
If this happens, the bill's gone. And you say it's an insurance policy. Uh, it sounds to me like a political way of trying to raise people's concerns and fears that maybe it won't work. But what we've had has not worked. It hasn't worked for American jobs. It ha certainly hasn't worked for the steel industry. It hasn't worked for the workers there. Go tell them they're better off with no law. And I think they've looked at it and said, maybe there's a chance in this legislation to really transform our economy, that, uh, that we can restructure our economy and create more jobs. We've already given up the idea that we don't manufacture things in the United States. Let's rethink that. Let's bring manufacturing back here. We want to kickstart our economy with clean energy jobs. We'll go on to reestablish American leadership in clean technology industries. If we develop these clean technologies, people around the world are going to be waiting to buy it. And I'd rather they buy it from us than to buy it from China or some other country that won't even be attempting to do what we want to do here in the United States. So I would ur urge a rejection of this amendment. And my uh, yield back, I'll yield the last uh, 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you all know that I represent Silicon Valley, and it's a place that um, uh, really offers a great deal of hope to the country. Um, entrepreneurs, risk takers, uh, not afraid to take on the big questions. Many of you have traveled through and visited with many of the uh, places there, the small companies, the medium size, and even the large. Without objection, I'd like another two minutes so I can yield to the gentlelady. No, no objection being heard. The gentlelady has two additional minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm raising this is because there is such skepticism and an underlying fear uh, is if we're going to go off the edge of a precipice. Let me tell you that the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley are chomping at the bit, chomping at the bit, uh, excited, can't wait to see the results of this bill in order to grow and to build and to manufacture all that will be part of a new uh, 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 a part of our national economy. Um, now, I mean, the people that I'm speaking of uh, don't change their party registration simply because I represent them. I mean, they are known around the world for what they have built, how they think, and what they do. And there are many of them that are your persuasion of, of uh, party registration rather than mine. But they are highly, highly confident in what we are doing and why we need to do it. And I share this with you now, hopefully giving you a little inoculation, uh, kind of a vitamin B shot. Uh, I mean, we're Americans, for heaven's sakes. Where is it written that we can't do, that we don't know how, that we are afraid? Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to say something, but I. I think maybe that's why I stayed here all the time everybody else was gone. To, uh, I listened to the skepticism, but I, I want to share the optimism yes. uh, that is there by some of the best minds and some of the best leaders in our country. Thank yeah, you. I'm going to reclaim my time. Thank you, you come from an area of the country where they didn't sit around and say nothing can be done. They created whole new enterprises using their minds, using some of the resources. It came about from government investments. And uh, I think we have to recognize not that we can't do this, we can't do that, because the status quo is no great bargain, but that we can do a lot more than we've been doing. And we've got to do more than we've been doing because our whole independence as a country and our need for new jobs demands it. Uh, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to speak in support of the, uh, of the Murphy Amendment. I have been relatively quiet on some of these specific protection amendments. Um, but I do want the record to show I, I, I don't have a steel manufacturing capability in my district where you start from iron ore and coke and it create the steel. But I do have two of the most efficient, if not the most efficient in the world, 
many mills in my congressional district, one located in Jewett, Texas, and the other in Middle Othian, Texas, that take scrap cars and metal and melt it down in an electric arc furnace. They're the two largest users of electricity in the state of Texas. Uh, those two facilities, plus a fabrication facility in Grapeland, Texas, between them employ between 1,500 and 2,000 steel, what we call steel workers. Now, they're not the kind of steel workers that Mr. Doyle has where they create the steel from, a, from raw materials, but, but they, are, they do uh, recycle steel and they do uh, fabricate steel. Um, until this last year, uh, where we've had this recession, uh, those facilities were working overtime and, and were, 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 were very profitable. Um, they have not been negatively impacted by NAFTA. I would point out that Mexico makes very little steel. We may have had job losses to Mexico because of NAFTA and other areas, but not in, uh, not in steel. Our competitors in steel are China and India and to some extent Great Britain uh, and Japan. Uh, uh, it is not Mexico. Uh, and I voted for NAFTA. And NAFTA has quadrupled trade between Mexico, Canada, and the United States. Doesn't mean there haven't been some job losses, but on a net basis, there have been jobs created in the United States, jobs created in Canada, and jobs created in Texas. But back on the steel, which is the focus of this amendment, what Mr. Murphy is saying here is that if, in fact, the proponents of this legislation are wrong and 10,000 jobs in the steel sector do disappear, then this title not the whole bill, this title shall cease. Now, if you think about it, one of the largest components in the cost of steel is the price of energy. And all your offsets and all your allowances and all of your rebates doesn't detract from the fact that electricity prices are going to go up, not down. Now, you may get some rebates and you may get, but electricity prices are going to go up. And I know for a fact that a, a $500 million steel improvement project, which was designed to go to Grapeland, Texas, at the existing new core facility, did not go there because the price differential in electricity in Texas and some states that I'm not going to name, Texas was three cents above the price of electricity than the state that that project went to. You cannot sit here and tell us that if prices go up for electricity in this country because of this bill, that some steel jobs are not going to be lost because electricity is a huge component. So all this amendment says is if we lose 10,000 jobs, the, f the thing that caused the price to go up, we're going to stop implementing it. If, 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 if you don't think prices are going to go up in electricity, you're not going to lose anything by voting for this amendment. But if, if Mr. Shimkus and Mr. Murphy are right, it is a protector. We don't want Mike Doyle to lose one job. We don't want Tim Murphy or John Shimkus to lose one job in their district because of this bill. Mr. Waxman doesn't want anybody to lose a job. But it is at least theoretically possible, and I would say it is an absolute economic fact of life, that people are going to lose jobs when electricity prices go up because jobs are going to migrate. And they're not going to migrate somewhere else in the United States because this act applies to every covered entity in the United States. So I would, I would hypothesize that we should vote for this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I uh, ask unanimous consent for you to be given an additional minute, would you yield it to me?
I will. Without objection, the gentleman has an additional minute, and I thank him for yielding to me. But I remember when we did the Clean Air Act, and people said we were going to lose all sorts of jobs. The cost of the economy was going to be, it was going to be so exorbitant that we wouldn't be able to sustain it. And they were wrong. We heard those predictions, and they were wrong. I, I would think that uh, I have more confidence in the plan that uh, Congressman Boucher uh, developed and urged us to adopt, which we accepted, to allow the utilities to get the free allowances on condition that those free allowances be used to protect the ratepayers. I believe that's going to work. I believe it. Mr. Chairman. And I think that in doing that, we won't have the, uh, the loss of jobs because of the cost of electricity. And during that period of time, we're going to be able to figure out ways to get our reductions from the carbon emissions, not by raising electricity prices, by, but by using the offsets, developing the technology, and moving toward a, uh, uh, a place where we can be more efficient and use renewables. Uh, I thank you, the gentleman. I exceeded the uh, one minute. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. McNerney. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. You know, I, I certainly uh, appreciate the concern about jobs, and we've heard over and over uh, that this bill is going to cost jobs, as if saying it over and over would make it true. But the opposite is true. We're going to lose jobs if we don't pass this bill. In my mind, history is clear. Yes, I've lived it. I, have. I worked in the wind industry. American money was spent creating wind turbine technology right here in this country, and because renewable energy wasn't supported, those jobs went overseas. Most wind turbines are manufactured in Europe right now. We need to bring those home. Today they're being manufactured in India, in Europe, and all other countries. Uh, just the other week, just last week, there was an article in the New York Times showing that China now leads us in the production of clean coal. We need to, this process is happening again. We need to stop that. We need to allow innovation to return to this country and create jobs here. Moreover, other countries are going to start putting roadblocks in the way of our companies if we don't adopt greenhouse gas capping in this country. Europeans are going to do it if we don't participate in Copenhagen. So again, I certainly appreciate the desire of our colleagues to protect jobs. However, it seems to me that our colleagues on the other side of this aisle are more determined to stop the bill and to kill any chance we have of limiting carbon. But we haven't said a single word about the big elephant in this room, and that's global warming. It appears that the Republicans in this room, in this, in this House, don't believe that global warming is a serious threat. Either they think it's not happening, or they think that if it is happening, humans are causing it, or if humans are causing it, it's too expensive for us to do anything about. In other words, let's keep our heads in the sand and hope for the best. That's defeatist. The scientific evidence is overwhelming that global warming is happening. The situation is urgent. We're dangerously close to tipping points. Do you want to go over and tell the next generation, the children that we heard about last night, and explain to them why we didn't take action while we had a chance? Well, we're in an emergency and we need to take action. This amendment that we're saying right now will allow global warming to proceed. I urge all of my colleagues to vote against it. And I yield back the balance of my time. gentleman yields back the balance of his time. I'd like to move to the vote on this amendment. Are members ready to proceed to the vote? Let's, uh, let's ask for, let's get a roll call vote. And let's, who's seeking recognition? What, for what purpose the gentleman seek it? Would the gentleman be willing to do it in two minutes? How many other members? Okay. How many other members are going to ask for recognition on this amendment? Okay. The gentleman's recognized for two minutes, and then we're going to go to the vote.
I'm sorry, what, what are you saying to me? Are you saying something? Marsha Blackman wanted recognition. Okay. Microphone. Well, look, I'm willing to, I'm willing to uh, yield two minutes to the gentleman from Arizona and two minutes to the gentlewoman from uh, Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Uh, and I'd like to then go to the vote. And uh, I hope members will cooperate. Otherwise, I think we're going we're gonna to have to vote on it. and point out that in this debate, uh, the reality has been very different than we just heard. Not a single amendment has been offered on this side to repeal the bill instantaneously. Not a single amendment has been offered on this side to say the bill would never go into effect. Not a single amendment has been offered on this side to say we would have no cap and trade or no greenhouse gas program whatsoever. What we have said and said repeatedly is that we want there to be tests. We want there to be checkpoints. We want there to be, quite frankly, to use the language of the former chairman of the Subcommittee on Energy, off-ramps. Off-ramps that protect not us, not ourselves, not us personally, but our constituents, working men and women across America. We said one of those off-ramps ought to be if overall employment across the nation goes up, there ought to be an off-ramp. We said if uh, gas prices go up dramatically, there ought to be an off-ramp. We said that if electricity prices go up, beyond an acceptable limit, there ought to be an off-ramp. This particular amendment says uh, that if there are increases, unacceptable increases in the employment of steel workers, there ought to be an off-ramp. And yet, we get rejected and rejected and rejected. But the argument that is made to reject us is bizarre. It is, we absolutely know on our side of the aisle, referring to the majority side of the aisle, that none of the things you're concerned about the increase in unemployment nationally won't ever happen, so we don't want an off-ramp. The gas prices that you're concerned about increases won't ever happen, so we don't want an off-ramp. The increases in electric prices won't ever happen, so we don't want an off-ramp. I would suggest that your conduct proves you don't have any faith that those things won't happen, because if you actually believed they would never happen, you would agree to allow each of these on-ramps, because you would say, yep, you're right. Those are never going to happen, so we'll allow the suspension of this act if they ever do happen. And I think your conduct impeaches your words. And I yield back my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will be brief. Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, the gentleman from California just mentioned that the global warming, this is irrefutable. The science is out there. I think he will be happy to know that this week in Nashville, Tennessee, we had a frost warning. Now, we've already been through blackberry winter, strawberry winter, dogwood winter, red bud winter, all those things that come in the spring when the weather starts to warm up and you are going through spring. Well, this week, we had a major cooling trend. We've had the coldest winter in 113 years. So there is much debate about whether or not global warming would does really exist. Scientists refute this. When you talk about jobs and the future in children, I will tell you we are very concerned about jobs. And when I have a letter from Caterpillar put on my desk and they're talking about losing jobs, if we pass this legislation, it causes me to be very concerned for future generations, for children like my grandson who is one year old this week and another grandchild that is going to arrive in June. What are we doing to the opportunities for them if we limit their opportunity for jobs and jobs growth? Last night or night before last, I asked if anybody had a copy of a study that could show that there were net job gains because of a country implementing cap and trade practices. What I have is the study from Spain that shows there are net job losses. We know the same thing happened in England, also in Germany, also in Denmark. I'm still waiting to see if there is any study from any country that shows they actually had a net jobs gain. So this is why we are saying, let's put some checks and balances in here. Let's have some times to revisit this if we need to revisit. I yield back. Thank you for yielding back. We'll now proceed to uh, a vote on the uh, Murphy Amendment. The clerk will please call the roll. 
Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak votes no. No. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Barlow. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton. I'm moving. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Aye. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. <laughs> Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Matheson, no. 
Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Mr. Pallone. Yeah. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Melanson. Right, um, Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Ross. No. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Aye. Mr. Shimkus votes aye. All members respond to the vote. Anybody want to change the response to the vote? Clerk will report the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 20, the nays were 35. The, the yeas were 20? The yeas were 20. 20, okay. 20 ayes, 30. Five no. The amendment is not agreed to. The uh, amendment that we were debating and we're going to vote on in a minute is the Terry Amendment. Right. And I'd like to have uh, a uh, summary of the arguments in two minutes on each side. Mr. Terry, are you, are you uh, ready? I am prepared. You are prepared. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very quickly, the EPA is uh, touting a new uh, life cycle, uh, carbon life cycle for biofuels, which would include an assumption that... Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, the committee is not in order. The committee will be in order. I want to restore the gentleman's time. Thank you. The uh, life cycle would also include any rainforests that have been destroyed somewhere else in the world under the assumption that uh, if you've Rain. used a, uh, Color. let's say, feed yes. corn, instead of feeding cattle, you gave it to the co-op that was sent to the ethanol maker that that then made or forced uh, Indonesia to have to uh, deforest some of the rainforest and therefore there's not as many trees to suck up the uh, carbon dioxide and that has to be counted into the life cycle. That's an actual rule. I'm not being preposterous or absurd here. This is being proposed by the EPA. I think it's uh, beyond silly that uh, you calculate in the deforestation of a rainforest in some other place in the world and somehow make an assumption that whatever that country's decision was on that rainforest should count against biofuels. Uh, this is A, it just absurd. Uh, B, what this does then it gives full power to the EPA to in essence ban biofuels. If they don't ban it under this life cycle calculation, uh, you're going to get lawsuits from the environmental groups that will force the uh, end to biofuels. Uh, I think it's unfair to count uh, the destruction of any rainforest. There's parts of this bill that will allow the reforestation through funding from this bill, uh, but don't blame it on our farmers who are producing grain uh, that goes to biofuels. And I think that's a pretty good, accurate summary, Mr. Chairman, and I'll yield back my last 10 seconds. Thank the gentleman for yielding back and for his comments. I now I wish to recognize Mr. Markey for two minutes. Uh, I thank the chair. In opposition. I thank the chair. Uh, 
Uh, I oppose um, the gentleman from Nebraska's amendment. Uh, accurately counting the global warming pollution from the use of biofuels is difficult. Uh, the experts at the EPA have put forth uh, a proposal uh, to create a methodology to deal with it. However, they are now receiving vigorous responses from stakeholders uh, all across America. That is good. These are the experts. Our goals here in the 2007 Energy Bill, as our goals are here today, are to reduce our dependence on imported oil and to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that go up into the atmosphere. We have to ensure, as we move forward on biofuels, that we accomplish that goal. That is what this study is all about. We must have the facts before us. This, um, this proposal by the gentleman from Nebraska would short circuit that uh, process. That would be a huge mistake. Let me turn and recognize the gentleman from Washington State uh, to conclude. Uh, this is a hard issue, but willful ignorance is not a path for this country. And we cannot afford, we cannot afford to ignore the fact that 20 percent of all the greenhouse gas emissions come from land conversion. I am a big backer. I am bullish on biofuels. But I want to point out two things. Number one, all of the grain that is going to ethanol today is grandfathered. It is not affected by this provision. All of the grain going to ethanol today is grandfathered. It is not affected by this provision. Number two, when we convert property and land use to these purposes from jungle to some other system, we emit 30 to 60 percent of the emissions you do in a gallon of gasoline. We cannot recreate that. We have to bas base this on science. We can't turn our backs on science, and we would be doing that if we passed this amendment. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. We will now proceed to a roll call vote. The clerk will please call the roll. Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Dingell? No. Mr. Dingell votes no. Mr. Markey? Mr. Markey? No. Mr. Boucher? Mr. Pallone? No. Mr. Pallone? No. Mr. Gordon? Mr. Rush? Mr. Rush? No. Ms. Eshoo? No. Ms. Eshoo? No. Mr. Stupak? No. Mr. Stupak? No. Mr. Engel? No. Mr. Engel? No. Mr. Green? No. Mr. Green? No. Ms. DeGette? No. Ms. DeGette? No. Mrs. Caps? No. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Doyle? Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon? No. Ms. Harmon, no. <clears throat> Ms. Chikowsky? No. Ms. Chikowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez? No. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee? No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin? No. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross? Mr. Weiner? No. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson? No. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield? No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson? No. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow? Aye. Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill? Mr. Hill votes aye. Ms. Matsui? No. Ms. Matsui? No. Mrs. Christensen? No. Mrs. Christensen? No. Ms. Castor? Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes? No. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut? No. Mr. Murphy? No. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes aye. 
Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes present. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Deal. Aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. No. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich, Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. No. Ms. Bono Mack votes no. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. <laughs> Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Ms. Myrick. Ms. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. No. Mr. Sullivan votes no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Murphy of Pennsylvania votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? <laughs> Any member wish to be change his or her vote? Mr. Chairman, have I recorded? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Barton is recorded as present. I would vote no. Mr. Barton is off present and on no. Clerk, uh, ready to report the vote? On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 20 and the nays were 36. 20 ayes, 36 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. M Mr. Chair? Who's seeking recognition? Mr. Chair, just for, uh, for note of personal privilege, just briefly. I mean, I'm just recognized briefly. I, I just want to note, uh, during that last debate, I used a comment uh, uh, of willful ignorance, and I want my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to know I was not referring to them. Mr. Terry brought up a serious I issue. I thought you were talking about the EPA. <laughs> <laughs> and it was okay with us. <laughs> I just want to make sure I didn't mean Mr. Terry or anybody else. Thanks very much. What a gentleman. <laughs> For uh, what purpose? <laughs> oh, uh, Ms. Eshoo, have we, have we done your amendment? You've been sitting here all this time. Well, I'm going to recognize you. And if, if, yes, gentle ladies recognized for an amendment. Clerk will report it. Amendment offered by Ms. Eshoo of Without California. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentlelady is recognized to uh, speak. Thank you, Mr. Behalf. Chairman. Uh, the, um, the amendment is, um, was submitted in a timely fashion and uh, is, a, uh, is part of uh, this title.
Um, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, the, this amendment will ensure that the EPA is provided with the flexibility needed to make uh, the best judgments uh, regarding how one class of greenhouse gases, fluorinated gases, are regulated under the cap. Fluorinated gases are critical in the manufacture of high technology devices such as uh, semiconductors and solar photovoltaic materials. Many of these gases are never emitted after being sold to the users, and so they never contribute to global warming. The gases are frequently destroyed by companies that use them, such as large semiconductor manufacturers. So this amendment in no way removes these high global warming potential gases from regulation. Instead, it requires the EPA to assess whether the way in which such gases are regulated under the cap is appropriated. If the EPA determines that, in, that industrial users of the fluorinated gases should be responsible for holding allowances rather than the producers, then the EPA would have the ability to change this point of regulation. Um, my amendment does not address high, uh, hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs, which are treated separately in the, uh, in the bill, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I think this will provide the EPA with the flexibility that it needs uh, to, um, for some of our nation's most important high technology businesses and uh, that they be regulated in the most uh, appropriate way. Gentlelady Yield. Be glad to. Uh, I support this amendment. Uh, we aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the most cost effective and administratively simple way. And what you're suggesting is that we have an EPA study to determine the best point of regulation for the fluorinated gases other than hydrocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons used by the semiconductor industry and other industries. I think this makes a lot of good sense, and I would hope members would support it. Yield Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. You yield back your time. Mr. Barton. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment, and I want to um, refer members to, to a couple of sentences in the amendment on line 6. It says, are at the source of emissions downstream, at the source of the emissions downstream, and then down on line 11 and 12, can best be regulated by designating downstream emission sources as covered entities. Now, I know it's not the gentlelady's intention, but this study could have the result of giving the EPA the authority to regulate consumer goods in people's homes, like refrigerators, air conditioners, fire extinguishers. I'm not saying it will. And the fact that she puts cost effectiveness in there would, would be a one area that might preclude that. But uh, given the reach of this EPA, uh, it is certainly um, feasible and it, that they might decide to go that route. I personally don't want the EPA uh, in my kitchen, or uh, <laughs> looking at the air, looking at the fire extinguisher in the trunk of my car, and this could be the result of this amendment. So I would uh, respectfully oppose it. Would the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. Um, I know that the gentleman's into privacy, so I'll, that's why you don't want anyone in your kitchen or your car trunk. But well, um, even I haven't cleaned stuff. up my kitchen in the last six months. Well, I don't want anybody. You got to get your kitchen. wife to town so you yes, can do some right. cleaning before she arrives. <laughs> um, on a serious note, um, on uh, the use of the word downstream, uh, Mr. Barton and uh, colleagues, that really uh, uh, is for industrial uh, uh, users, and where we've used the word upstream. Uh, they are um, uh, uh, producers. So I, I, th this is not a backhanded way to do refrigerators or anything else. Most frankly, if that's what I wanted to do, I would have had a separate amendment on it, whether it would be supported or not by some members of the committee. But I have no uh, reason to mix in yeah. um, the regulation of, um, of energy efficiency of refrigerators and mix it in with the semiconductor industry. Would the gentlelady well, yield? Well, it's his time. Okay, sure. Um, Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it, uh, I, I thank the gentleman. If you look down to line 12 and 13, uh, you can see that 
the phrase up in line six and seven at the source of emissions downstream, meaning the semiconductor factory, um, and down in line 12 and 13 as covered entities. So uh, the factory is covered, but individuals' homes are not under, that is, as covered entities in the statute. So it, what, what, it, what the, the combination of those two make clear is that uh, what this amendment would refer to are the semiconductor factories as the point uh, where the regulation would, in fact, take place. Uh, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. I yield back the balance of my time. Let's proceed to a vote on this amendment. Do you want a roll call vote? Show of hands. Uh, those who are uh, supporting this amendment, please raise your hand. We'll do this just on a show of hands. Those opposed, please raise your hand. Just one hand. <laughs> Inform us of, uh, of the tally. Mr. Chairman, that division vote, there were 26 ayes and 10 noes. 26 ayes, 10 noes, the amendments agreed to. Uh, I've, I've been talking to uh, Mr. Barton, and we think that uh, we could get a lot of work done if we limit uh, the debate. Uh, and uh, we'll allow 10 minutes on each side. Uh, uh, but I would encourage people to take even less time. So this uh, will put people on notice that we'll probably move through and get a bunch of votes, so don't go too far away. I would, Mr. Barton. I, I, I have agreed to that with one proviso. There may be a few amendments that require slightly more time, but in general, I think that's a fair way to do business for the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now uh, recognizing members who have amendments to Title Three. And I look to the Republican side of the aisle. Mr. Chairman, over here in the broom Dr. closet behind the kitchen. Mr. Stand. Burgess, way, way over there. I'll see Mr. Burgess. Burgess. I want to recognize you. Do you have an amendment? Yes, uh, amendment is Burgess 029XML. And I, I took a picture of it with my iPhone and the <laughs> clock in the background yesterday, but I didn't have the date stamped on it. Uh, without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and I'd like to recognize the gentleman to uh, uh, speak on his amendment for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Uh, the uh, manager's amendment, the amen amendment in the nature of a substitute in for before us, ensures a price for carbon credits and a market for trading those carbon credits. Now, these may be the ingredients for a very interesting recipe in creating Wall Street's newest hottest fun exotic financial instrument. We're all aware that if something has a price, the wizards on Wall Street will find a way to derive new and fascinating financial instruments to option, hedge, and swap, and create fees for trading these new instruments that derive their value from the price of the underlying asset. If you don't think this can happen, we don't have to think too far back to remember Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, and what about the currency manipulation by George Soros? The current financial crisis has heightened our awareness of the use of financial derivatives like mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps and the effect they have on the value of the tangible asset in the marketplace. This committee a year ago held hearings on dark markets and the off-market commodity trading on the Intercontinental Exchange. We can ill afford to set up this type of system without adequate protections in place. Mr. Chairman, the best medicine is preventive medicine, not after the fact radical surgery, the type of radical surgery that we've seen in our financial markets this past year. Now, 
Thomas Friedman writing in the New York Times on April 8, 2009, in an uh, op-ed column, stated that Americans will be willing to pay a tax, but they are much less likely to support a firm in London trading offsets from an electric bill in Boston with a derivatives firm in New York in order to help fund an aluminum smelter in Beijing, which is what cap and trade is all about. People won't support what they can't explain." End quote. Mr. Chairman, this amendment very simply prohibits the transfer or receipt of carbon credit derivatives. It is a simple amendment. It is preventive medicine at its best, and I urge members to support its passage. And I will yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The Chair would like to uh, now recognize Mr. Stupak. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As uh, most of you know, for the last three years I have worked in this area uh, trying to regulate these markets, and I, I think the Burgess amendment, amendment is well intended. However, when, when I take a look at it, and actually this legislation, uh, because of work I have done with the Chairman and Mr. Markey and others, we have the, the PUMP Act, the act I have worked on for the last three years, prevent the unfair manipulation of prices, is in this legislation and not just to oil and gas and energy, but also to, to the carbon assurance market that, that we have set up in this legislation. And, and my only concern with the Burgess's amendment, it would completely ban the trading of carbon allowance futures and other derivatives. And, and I think this could be a, a bad idea. The most important reason for trading in these futures is to give regulated entities some certainty about future costs. We have heard so much about costs and anticipation in a regulatory scheme that is in this legislation that we have put in in the last few days, uh, we are giving the entities some certainty about what their costs will be. If a regulated utility knows it will need carbon credits or carbon allowances a decade from now, it can lock in those allowances at a specific price and not have to worry about unexpected changes in price. Uh, derivatives trading isn't about helping out Wall Street. It's really about reducing the market unpredictability, and really helping the utilities and the affected industries here to plan to gain some certainty, so they'll be more easily able to plan and budget for future. I'm also concerned that the amendment would do nothing to prevent trading of carbon derivatives on foreign markets by overseas agents, as we see with ICE, the Intercontinental Exchange, which is all traded here, but closes in London and. CFTC says we have no control over that. We change all that in this legislation. The most aggressive, most comprehensive regulation of these markets, the dark markets, the exchanges, is now found in this legislation that we have been able to put in. So I am very concerned that the foreign market loophole would continue underneath the Burgess Amendment. The Waxman-Markey bill, as written, will tightly control and effectively regulate carbon allowance derivatives. This amendment would drive these trades to un the Burgess Amendment, I believe, would drive these trades to unregulated markets overseas. The net effect of Mr. Burgess Amendment, and, and Mike's been on the Oversight Committee with me for some time. I know it's well intended. I just think would actually increase the risk of fraud and market manipulation. So at this point in time, I would urge my colleagues not to support this amendment. I will be offering an amendment next, granting a cease and desist order. Because one of the problems we see in this area, even though we find speculation, we find increased prices, we find market manipulation, FERC, Fed Federal Energy Regulatory Committee, has no authority to say stop and freeze the assets. So that will be the next amendment we got following up just to even tighten the Waxman Markey bill even tighter. So all this area we've worked on for the last couple of years on market regulation, manipulation, speculators in the market, we have a very tightly controlled in this bill, and we and we actually close the foreign loophole. We do away with most of the derivatives. So our, our bill is much more comprehensive than what Mr. Burgess is trying to do. Again, with good intention. Yield? I just think it doesn't go far enough, and I'd ask yield? for no vote, and I'd yield to Mr. Markey. There's no question derivatives must be regulated. They weren't regulated, largely. The language which the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, after his three years of working on this issue here and in other areas to make sure that there is very strong regulation, is central to ensuring not just that this market, but that any market uh, can work. And
uh, Mr. Stupak has been the leader in Congress uh, over the last three years and insisting that that be the case. And the language here is as tight uh, a, a set of regulations as has ever been imposed on derivatives. And I just wanted to thank Mr. Stupak for all of his work. Well, will the gentleman yield? Sure. Will the gentleman yield for a question? Uh, Mr. Stupak, perhaps we could shed some light on this. We'll just ask a question of counsel as to whether or not, now I presume you're talking about subtitle uh, E and on page 702 and 703 in the amendment, the nature of a substitute, is that correct? It's part of it, could, yes. Could, it's could, found throughout the bill. Could we, could we ask a counsel if that subtitle that, uh, that has been added to the amendment, if that, if that prohibits trading in uh, speculation in the, in the derivatives market? This subtitle E begins on page 701. Can I ask that question of counsel? Counsel, respond. Uh, regulated allowance derivatives are, are addressed in both subtitle D and subtitle E. Subtitle D includes several prov provisions related to regulated allowance derivatives, including default rules. Um, you'll see on page 695, uh, paragraph 4B, all contracts for the purchase or sale of any regulated allowance derivative shall be executed on or through a board of trade designated as a contract market under the Commodity Exchange Act. May, may I further ask, does this cover the price of carbon credits? Could you clarify your question? No, could you clarify your answer? <laughs> are, are, this, this provision Please. here essentially um, is a default rule against over-the-counter trading of regulated allowance derivatives. But does this prohibit trading on the price of carbon derivatives? No. It does not prohibit trading of derivatives. And, and Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, that therein is the problem. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission, as we heard in testimony in our subcommittee a year ago in this very room, refused to take any action when they saw, when the whole world could see that there was a problem. All I'm saying is let's not wait for those conditions to exist again, bubble up and boil over. Let's prevent it at the source. This market doesn't need liquidity. I don't really know what a ton of carbon dioxide looks like. Uh, I, I doubt that anyone would ever actually take receipt of a ton of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. But the fact of the matter remains, you're going to have a lot of people playing in this market who really do not have an ownership stake in that carbon dioxide and as a consequence are only doing it for the financial aspect. We saw where that led us last summer. It's a dangerous road. We shouldn't go down it with this cap and trade legislation. I think we've had a good debate. Now let's proceed to a vote. Mr. Rogers. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, I, I, just, I would stipulate that uh, Council actually agreed with me that subtitle B, D and E do not, uh, do not prohibit the trading of the, of the carbon derivatives. Well, the gentleman is correct. It does not prohibit the trading, but it does limit it very severely. And with the penalties that are in the bill, I believe Mr. Stupak would argue that uh, we have uh, uh, made sure that uh, we've learned the lessons and we're going to prohibit these abuses. Mr. Chairman, um, with all due respect, you cannot make a rule that some clever criminal will not run rings around this committee, and I'll yield back. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rogers, how much time do you want? Two, two minutes, and then we're going to go to a vote. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the opportunity uh, to stop the vultures who are flying around this issue right now. People who came in front of this committee to testify and say what a great bill this is will make billions of dollars off of average Americans struggling to pay their light bills. That's what will happen, even if you get it right. And as a former FBI guy, I'll tell you, we won't get it exactly right. There will be somebody who scams this system because there is never any time you can take delivery of anything. This is a scam. And when you get people who probably wrote big chunks of this bill who will go out and make as much money as they will by taking it away from honest, good old-fashioned Americans who are trying to make it, it's just dead wrong. This is the only way we can guarantee that those families are not going to get ripped off by a system where Wall Street and derivatives are going to help them improve the environment. Or gentlemen, you? Uh, I, I don't have much time, but yes, I'll yield. But look at the legislation. 
we, we've put in the, the, the rules of the Pump Act of 2009. We ban naked credit default swaps. We include only bona fide hedging. We have an advisory committee with the CFTC that tells you and sets energy limit positions, including carbon. We included a CFTC inspector general. We eliminate the swaps loophole. We exclude FERC from financial transactions and, and uh, with rights my, for with my 30 seconds. Changes. And I appreciate the general's point that he, the, the gentleman's point. He's tried to put in any protections. Uh, we didn't try. This it's is, in the bill. But th th this is the real difference here. You're either going to side with the people who are trying to pay these electric bills, or you're no. going to side with Wall Street. No, you for the first time ever, no. we're going to regulate Wall this Street, which they are not doing time. right now. Under no, you're the not regulating a market. You're selling something that doesn't exist in order to influence a market that you can't see and you can't take delivery of. That's why we. That's why yeah, Europe Mr. Mr. had. Stupac, it's that's why time. Europe had fraud problems with this. You can't control it. It's wrong to do it this way. There's a much better way to get a control on carbon, and it won't cost jobs, and it won't be the single largest energy tax in the history of the United States. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. What, what is it the gentleman's speak in your mic? What would you I'm, like? I'm going to ask for the yeas and nays on this. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'll ask for the yeas and nays on this, please. You ask for the yeas and nays, and we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. <coughs> Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes, <coughs> votes no. <coughs> Ms. Eshoo. <laughs> Mr. Stupak. No. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Gett. No. Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Go Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. No. Mr. Butterfield, no. <laughs> Mr. Melanson. No. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. Oh, no. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. No. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. No. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. No. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Up, yeah, Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich. 
Mr. Radanovich, aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Walden votes aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick, so that's kind of. I understand. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan votes aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingri. Aye. Mr. Gingri, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Gordon votes no. Ms. Eshoo. No. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green, no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? <laughs> Clerk will announce the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 22, the nays were 35. There's 22 ayes, 35 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Stupak, do you have an amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, amendment number 068. Uh, Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman be recognized for five like minutes. Reserve a point of order. A point of order is reserved, and the gentleman will be recognized for five minutes, and I hope we can uh, move this along expeditiously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've been talking about speculators in the market, and uh, thanks to you and Mr. Markey and others, uh, we've been able to work to put the uh, Pump Act, prevent the unfair manipulation of prices in this legislation. It's the most comprehensive legislation to try to crack down on market speculators. And, and what people say is that there is no speculation in the market. Some people will say that. But if you take a look at it right now, and, and these are not my figures, this is the Energy Information Administration. If you take a look at our supplies, our supplies are at the highest in 20 years. If you take a look at demand, the demand is the highest it's been in 10 years. Supplies up, demand's down, but yet since the first of the year, if you go to the first of the year, oil has gone up 70%. And this is through May, May 7th. I don't know about you, but back in my district this weekend, it was like 238, 239 a gallon. So it's even higher. It's probably about 75% increase since the first of the year. Where's that money going? Where's the manipulation? If you take a look at the markets, you see the phys fiscal hedgers, the people who actually rely upon oil and energy, or in this case, since we're creating a new market of carbon credits, utility companies, others, will be trying to get their hands and buy these credits. But what we find is the non-hedgers, the people who are in the market merely to make money, not to produce a product, not to reduce carbon credits. They're going to be in this market only to profit. In fact, when we come to oil, 99.9% .9 of the people who are buying these contracts never have intent of ever taken possession of a barrel of oil. It has been, oil has been used, carbon fossil fuels have been used for profit, not for a product. So what we've done, we've put very tight regulations. As we were going through this legislation and finalized everything, we realized the cease and desist order was not there. FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Committee, has repeatedly asked for cease and desist order. They do not have that right now. Even under the Bush administration, even under the Bush administration, they came to our committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee and other committees, and asked that they be given the cease and desist order. And this is the same cease and desist authority that is found under the Commodities Future Trade Commission and the SEC. Why do we need cease and desist? Natural gas, the Amherst case, which we all know about, in 2000 and 5, 2006, Amrith started to corner the market on natural gas, on the futures of natural gas. They're trading on NYMEX. NYMEX says you're getting too big, your positions are too large, 
you can't do that. You're controlling too much of the market. They said, fine, thank you. We'll leave NYMEX. We went to ICE, the Intercontinental Exchange, which is a dark market where there is no reporting. There's no transparency. They actually cornered 75% of the futures. They were betting in the winter of 2006, actually February of 2007, it would be very cold and people would need more natural gas. We had a warm front. They lost $6 billion. They imploded because they controlled so much of the market. What did the government do? The government said, you violate all of our laws. Your fine is $291 million. And Amherst said, fine. We don't have any de cease and desist order. The federal government could never collect. And Amherst sold off the little bit of assets they have left. We got nothing. The consumers were left with a $6 billion pay. We had to pay $6 billion more in natural gas because of the false uprun of prices that Amherst did. Cease and desist says, once we make a claim, stop what you're doing. We can seize and freeze your assets. So this amendment basically says, whether you're in the natural gas business or you're going to be in the carbon market, if you manipulate the market and CFTC, SEC, or the others come down and crack down on you, we can cease and desist, freeze your assets until the case is resolved. And it's a long amendment, 13 pages, because there's appeal rights and everything. We preserve every right there is. Once we bring an action, cease and desist selling off your assets until it is reserved. And if you think SEC or the FTC has done it wrong, you have a right to go to court to appeal that cease and desist order. That's the extent of my amendment in four minutes and 30 seconds. I real, yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Anybody wish to speak in opposition? Chairman. Mr. Barton. First, I want to uh, ask the council uh, on my point of order, Mr. Chairman, may I be recognized uh, on yes. that? Yes, gentlemen, recognized for five minutes. You want to assert your point of order? Well, I want to, uh, I want to ask council. Gentlemen's recognized. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the Natural Gas Act and FERC has to do with uh, the Clean Air Act and CO2 cap and trade. What's, what's, what's the tie-in? Yeah, where's the nexus here? How is this germane to uh, CO2 and the Clean Air Act and the EPA and, and all of the new entities that this act is creating? There are, this refers to three acts, uh, the Natural Gas Act, the Natural Gas Policy Act, and then makes um, a direct amendment uh, to one of the provisions in the in the legislation, uh, which refers to the Federal Power Act. Mr. Chairman, I, I can debate the substance of the amendment, but I honestly don't see the germaneness. What, what, what does this? I guess I would make a point of order that the it's not germane to. Um, the Clean Air Act and EPA and and um, CO2 and the other uh, greenhouse gases. Are, does this amendment give the uh, FERC the authority to regulate uh, those those uh, commodities? I guess I can just assert a point of order that it's not germane. Well, we're trying to an answer to. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, if you take a look at the last page, page 10, we refer to Section 401B3C3 of the Federal Power Act by adding Section 341. And we struck out the part, insert the act, therefore, the Federal Power Act, which is the controlling act, along with the Clean Air Act, in this whole legislation. That's the germaneness to this legislation, and that's our germaneness on this deal. Well, the chair is trying to get a parliamentary uh, opinion on the matter before I make any ruling. Just trying to assist the chair. I, that was very <laughs> helpful. And, and it seems to me we have several different acts referred to in the legislation before us. And when you have a number of uh, laws that are uh, under consideration,
it does bring in additional uh, policies that uh, could be germane because of that fact. But I don't want to make a ruling without getting a parliamentary interpretation. Would the um, so well, let's just wait a minute and let me see what I can find out. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may also, underneath this bill, we have given FERC, in, in the language even before I amended it, the right to regulate the carbon markets. So what this amendment is doing is really making a uniform standard for all parts and all regulations of FERC, whether it's natural gas or the carbon markets. So we had already given FERC the authority to regulate carbon markets in the legislation. The cease and desist order is making sure we're applying a uniform standard whether it's natural gas, whether it's the Federal Power Act, or whether it's the carbon markets on cease and desist, an authority the FERC did not have, but have repeatedly asked for, even going back to the last administration. I, um, I tend to think you're right, but I'd like to get a ruling by the parliamentarian, and I'm not sure if we can do that right now. Would the, uh, if there's no objection, I'd just like to put aside this amendment until we get that that ruling. That would be appropriate with me, Joe. Yes. Sure. Mr. Okay. Green. Mr. Chairman, I would just like to make sure when we take it up again we have adequate debate time and after, uh, after ruling on the. Oh, if, if it is real germane, we will have, I will give you some of my time if I have to. Okay. I am assuming you and I are on the same side on this, but I may be. Well, we'll, we, we would not want to deprive members of making their arguments, so we will. Um, uh, have the debate continue. <coughs> Is there uh, another, like Chair calls for another amendment to uh, Title III on the Democratic side? If not, we'll go to the Republican side. Ms. Blackburn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady has an amendment at the desk. And uh, Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and uh, distributed. If you'll wait a minute uh, before I call on you, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So that members can have a chance to see the amendment. Uh, I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from Texas at this time for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. The gentlelady Chairman. from Tennessee, what did I say? That is perfectly fine. You said Texas, and my husband is a Texan, so I. I must you know, have known that, and I got that's confused exactly because right. of that. <laughs> and, and that's fine. I appreciate it. Not because it. of the lateness of the hours. <laughs> We're going to be here much later. Uh, but uh, you'll get the full five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I know that we all are going to disagree on parts of this bill, and we're going to have a wonderful debate as we go through the next day, but I believe we can all agree that the EPA should not be allowed to move forward in regulating greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. It was never designed to address greenhouse gases, contrary to what the Supreme Court has said in the past. Now, your bill partially addresses this issue beginning on page 609 there at section 331. And while this is a good first step towards preempting the EPA, and then it continues over on page 616 again in part C with more preemption, this bill needs a provision that provides a very clear guidance to the EPA on this issue. My amendment does this by adding the language of what was H.R. 391 to Section 331. The amendment clearly states that greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane are not air pollutants. It also clarifies that the Clean Air Act does not authorize the EPA to regulate climate change or global warming. And there are some reasons that I think we should bring this back and make certain that it comes through Congress. Whatever happens, that Congress has the authority over this. We have heard from the EPA administrator in hearings here in this room. We know that they are laying forth guidance. 
to move forward on regulating CO2 if Congress does not pass a bill. We also know that this is a major policy shift. It is monumental for our country, and it should come to Congress for the stamp of the people's representatives. Now, the reason this is important to me is in Tennessee, we have a great example of what happens when you have a program that is done by executive order and done without the supervision of your state legislative bodies. And we find that example in the program called TenCare, which is our Medicaid delivery system, which was put in place the beginning of 1995 by executive order under an 1115 waiver from CMS. The program has grown. It has expanded. It now gobbles over, over 33 percent of the state budget, and the legislature cannot affect the program. It has to pay the bill. We do not want that to happen with cap and trade regulation. We know we're dealing with technologies that are unproven. They haven't been used. We are dealing with methodologies, as has been laid forth in the bill, that have never been used before because it's a premise that we have not approached. We have heard many on the other side of the aisle express concern about mandates and bureaucracies, and we appreciate your concern on what that would have on the cost of energy and the cost of products. We welcome that, but we know if it does not come to Congress for oversight, that we may lose the opportunity to affect that change. The legislation has been supported. My legislation, uh, H.R. 391, has been supported by the American Farm Bureau, the American Forest and Paper Association, the American Gas Association, the American Petroleum Institute, the Agricultural Retailers Association, Corn Refiners Association, the Florida Chamber, National Automobile Dealers Association, National Association of Manufacturers, the National Oil Seed Processors Association, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, Small Business and Entrepreneurship, Council, Tennessee Chamber, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Also, some think tanks, the American Conservative Union, Americans for Tax Reform, Competitive Enterprise Institute, Cooler Heads Coalition, National Center for Policy, Public Policy Research, Human Events, Tennessee Center for Policy Research. Mr. Chairman, this is a provision that needs to come before us in Congress. It does not need to go to the EPA, and I would encourage my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentle lady yields back the balance of her time. Chair recognizes Mr. Mark. I thank the uh, gentleman very much. Um, I rise in opposition to this amendment. Essentially, what this amendment will do is to repeal the most important environmental decision ever made by the Supreme Court of the United States. That decision was rendered in April of 2007. The case was Massachusetts versus EPA. In that decision, the Supreme Court ruled that carbon dioxide is a pollutant under the Clean Air Act, the Supreme Court of the United States. This amendment would essentially repeal that Supreme Court decision. This amendment proposes that we would repeal that even though the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, every National Academy of Science of every nation in the world has determined that carbon and the other listed uh, pollutants in this amendment uh, are in fact uh, a danger to the planet. Uh, and uh, there is no credible debate which now exists in terms of that relationship of those dangerous greenhouse gases and the warming of the planet. So as we sit and deliberate on this amendment, uh, that is essentially saying that carbon is not a pollutant, uh, we could consider other Thing, other laws of nature that we could repeal as well. But that would not be a useful exercise. Our, our committee should be guided by the science. We should be guided by what the experts tell us 
is a pathology which has beset our planet. And for this amendment to be considered uh, successfully in this uh, uh, committee, we would have to disregard all scientific evidence. Uh, and I do not think that would be wise. The premise of this entire legislation is that carbon is a danger to the planet, as determined, one, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and two, by the Supreme Court of the United States of America in April of uh, 2007. We might as well as say that the sun revolves around the earth, or that dinosaurs never existed, as to say that carbon is not a pollutant. Uh, I do not believe this is the correct course uh, to take, and I will yield uh, to the gentleman from uh, California. Thank you very much uh, for yielding to me. The amendment would declare that carbon dioxide is not an air pollutant. Well, that's a scientific and a finding, and it would eliminate any EPA authority to address the problem of global warming. The Clean Air Act protects all Americans against harm from air pollution. The law gives EPA tools to reduce pollution that threatens public health and the environment. Now, I don't, I agree with the idea that the Clean Air Act tools for reducing carbon dioxide from power plants and industrial sources, uh, while often are good tools, they're somewhat cumbersome. And that's why uh, the, I believe that we ought to pass this legislation. The solution is not to pretend that carbon dioxide isn't an air pollutant. It's to do something about it. And uh, that's, this bill gives EPA the authority to select, set a pollution limit or cap that applies to all covered sources and allows the sources the flexibility to achieve that limit at the lowest possible cost. That's not what the Clean Air Act says. But that's what this bill would say. The bill will also amend the Clean Air Act surgically, removing authority to regulate greenhouse gases in the areas where it wouldn't make sense. But this amendment would eliminate any authority to address the problem of global warming. And that's no response to the gravest environmental threat we've seen. So I uh, join my uh, colleague, uh, chairman of the subcommittee, in urging a defeat of the Blackburn Amendment. Yield my time back to him. And I, I thank the gentleman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Barton. Mr. Chairman, I, I rise in support of the Blackburn Amendment, and, and, and I want all the members, especially on the majority side, who worked so hard to try to um, create uh, allowances and specific offsets and credits for specific industries to, to listen very carefully. This amendment doesn't change anything in the pending bill except it clarifies that under the Clean Air Act, under the Clean Air Act, CO2 and these, these other hydrofluorocarbons are not pollutants under the definition of that act. Massachusetts versus EPA was a decision five to four in which the Supreme Court looked at the Clean Air Act and its amendments and said the following. Since the Clean Air Act and its amendments does not specifically state that CO2 is not a pollutant, a criteria pollutant under the terms of that act, it might be. And it directed the EPA to make a finding, to make a decision on whether, the, in fact, CO2, CO2 was an air pollutant under the terms of the Clean Air Act, and if so, should it be regulated? The Blackburn Amendment clarifies that under the regulatory authority granted to EPA under the Clean Air Act, it's not a criteria pollutant. If you don't accept this, since the pending bill, as far as we can tell, is silent. This entire apparatus that's been created, Mr. Doyle's allowances for the steel industry and Mr. Green's allowances for the refinery industry, 
and these various other free allowances for the utility sector and the phase-in periods and all of that could be rendered absolutely moot because the EPA under Massachusetts versus EPA could move ahead with its regulatory regime and over, over, uh, overrule this act of Congress. Gentlemen, yield to me. In a second, I will yield. Yeah. So, if all of the proponents of this legislation that have worked so hard to perfect it, as they put it, if they really, really think that's the way to go, they should be advocates of this because all the Blackburn Amendment does is specifically say that because of Massachusetts versus EPA, since they said the Clean Air Act is silent on CO2, it might be a criteria pollutant and the EPA had to decide. This says, this, this does exactly what Massachusetts versus EPA was trying to clarify by saying it is not. If we had put this language in the Clean Air Act Amendment back in 1990 or 1991 when it was before this very committee, we might not be having this, this legislation today. So I, I tell my friends on the Democratic side, do you want a dual track? Do you want to do all that you're doing legislatively and then have the EPA second guessing you if they don't think what you did makes sense? Do you want them to come in and overrule it by regulation? If that's what you want, vote against Blackburn. If on the other hand you want the Congress to make the decision, then you should vote for it because that, all that does is say whatever the Congress decides in this bill, if anything, is going to be dominant. Gentlemen, you'll... I will now yield. This bill is an amendment to the Clean Air Act. The bill before us amends the Clean Air Act. And what the uh, Blackburn Amendment would do is to, is to say that uh, a uh, carbon emission is not a pollutant. Well, EPA is, has a rule out, proposed rule out, saying there is, it is a criteria pollutant. That's the status of things now. If our bill passes without this amendment, we, we reshape how carbon emissions will be dealt with under the Clean Air Act. And I don't think we ought to pass this, re this amendment because I believe this amendment would negate the entire bill. It would well, say that carbon is not a pollution pollutant and therefore need not be regulated. Reclaiming my last nine seconds, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, I strongly disagree with your interpretation of this amendment. This, this amendment would give precedent, it would give authority to the legislation. This is simply clarifying and amending the definitional section of the Clean Air Act that does specifically say the other criteria pollutants that it regulates are pollutants. This simply says that CO2 is not one of those. It does not in any way negate the definitions and the control authority that your pending legislation would grant. With that, I strongly urge a yes vote and yield back the balance. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. We've had uh, five minutes by Ms. Blackburn and five minutes by Mr. Barton, five minutes by uh, Mr. Markey, and we agreed that we would go 10-10, uh, but Mr. Markey said he only needs two, two minutes, so I'm going to yield him two minutes. And then I'd like to proceed to the with, vote. With all due respect, if we're going to give Mr. Markey two minutes, we should yield the author of the amendment, Mrs. Blackburn, two minutes to close. If I have no problem with that. No. We will uh, yield two minutes to Mr. Markey and then two minutes to the author to close, and then we'll proceed to the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to list for everyone what our bill does. Here's what our bill does. It removes... EPA's Clean Air Act authority for just about every scary regulatory problem that this amendment purports to be solving. We remove EPA's authority to set new source performance standards for greenhouse gas emissions from stationary sources that will be under the cap. We remove EPA's authority to list greenhouse gases as criteria air pollutants or hazardous air pollutants on the basis of their effect on climate change. We remove EPA's authority to apply new source review rules 
to greenhouse gas emissions. We remove EPA's authority to consider greenhouse gas emissions when determining whether a stationary source needs a permit to operate. And we make sure that any ongoing proceedings, litigation and appeals under the Clean Air Act are unaffected by this legislation. Even with all of the substantial exemptions, however, uh, the existing Clean Air Act authorities will continue to have an important role to play with regard to automobiles and other mobile sources. You saw that deal announced on the White House lawn yesterday. Under that deal, that authority continues. It should not be preempted. And also emission sources outside of the cap that we are imposing uh, on uh, the covered entities inside of this statute, like landfills and wastewater treatment plants. But on balance, if you don't like the way in which the Clean Air Act has been administered, you should be happy because in this legislation we make sure that the EPA is preempted in all those areas with the, Will the gentleman yield? Ex exemptions. Uh, with that, my time Will has expired. I Will the gentleman yield? And the gentlelady will have two minutes to Will close. <laughs> The gentlelady from Tennessee is recognized for two minutes to close. I thank the chairman for yielding. I fully believe that Congress should have the prerogative to come in and define the parameters of the Clean Air Act. It should be the prerogative of Congress to decide what happens with CO2 emissions. It should not be done through the EPA and done administratively and administered without the guidance and the oversight and without Congress having the legislative authority to affect how that is carried out. It is a good amendment. It can be easily accomplished by inserting after Section 331 placing the amendment that is before you. It would create a Section 2 and it would define greenhouse gas regulation and certainly would make uh, would give us the guidance that Congress has the authority to carry that out. With that, I will gladly yield to the gentleman from Arizona the balance of my time. I thank the gentlelady for yielding and I just want to uh, make it very clear what Mr. Markey said. What Mr. Markey said is that by and large, uh, carbon dioxide and the other pollutants or the other materials listed, greenhouse gases listed in Mrs. Blackburn's amendment, by and large, they're regulated by the bill we're dating, debating today. But he acknowledged openly and clearly and candidly, and I appreciate that, that in point of fact, uh, those same uh, greenhouse gases are not completely regulated under this bill, and to the extent that they're not regulated under this bill, and he cited as an example automobile emissions of carbon dioxide, those are rep regulated separately uh, by the EPA under the Clean Air Act. What we have done and what we are doing is demonstrating that this isn't a comprehensive regulatory scheme. We are giving new authority to the EPA under this bill, but we are leaving otherwise extant authority there. I think that demonstrates a stunning lack of confidence in this bill and creates the potential for conflicting regulations between what's done under this bill and what's done under the Clean Air Act. Can I yield back the balance of my time? All time has expired. May the chair inquire from the author of the amendment. We can, uh, we can voice vote, we can have a show of hands, or we can go to roll call. What would you prefer? Mike, if you want to vote. Roll call. Okay, let's go to a roll call. I'm not trying to bind you on a vote. Mr. Chairman, we're going to want a roll call vote. Yeah, we're going Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. No. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. No. Mr. Stupak, no. <coughs> Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green, 
No. Ms. Jaguette? No. Ms. Jaguette votes no. Mrs. Capps? No. Mrs. Capps, no. Mr. Mr. Doyle? No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon? Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Schakowsky? No. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez? No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee? No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin? No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross? Mr. <coughs> Weiner? No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson? No. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield? No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melison? No. Mr. Melison, no. Mr. Barrow? Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill? No. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui? No. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen? Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor? No. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut? No. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space? Mr. McNerney? No. Mr. McNerney, no. Mr. Bray, um, I'm sorry, Miss. Ms. Sutton? No. Ms. Sutton? No. Mr. Braley? Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Barton? Aye. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Upton? Aye. <clears throat> Mr. Upton? Aye. Mr. Stearns? Aye. Mr. Stearns votes aye. Thanks. Mr. Deal? Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield? Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus? Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck? Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. <coughs> Mr. Blunt? Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer? Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich? Aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts? Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack? Aye. Ms. Bono Mack? Aye. Mr. Walden? Aye. Mr. Walden? Aye. Mr. Terry? Aye. Mr. Terry? Aye. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Mrs. Myrick? Mr. Sullivan? Aye. Mr. Sullivan? Aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn? Aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry? Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise? Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. <coughs> Mr. Boucher? No. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Rush? No. Mr. Rush votes no. <coughs> Mr. Pallone? Yeah. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Ross? No. Mr. Ross votes no. <coughs> Mr. Space? No. Mr. Space votes no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Clerk will tally the vote. On the vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 23 ayes and 33 noes. 23 ayes, 33 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. Amendments now on the Democratic side. Mr. Hill, do you have an amendment? I have an amendment, yes, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. And let's pass out the amendment before I call on uh, Mr. Hill to speak on his amendment. 
don't have it. Do you have an identifying number on that? Is there a number identifying that amendment? Zero, zero, 002. Hill, zero, zero, 002. This says for Title IV, Mr. Chairman. Is that not correct? That not correct? What, what is the question? It's supposed to be it, Title III. It, it's Title III. They wrote Title IV on here. We had it in the wrong box, but it's Oh, it was in the wrong we box, but it. you found it. Yeah. Do we have that amendment distributed? Yes, we do. They're pulling it right now. Mr. Hill's recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this won't take long, and I think uh, perhaps it will not be controversial, because I believe that most of us believe that uh, when we're trying to determine uh, what is a greenhouse gas, that good science should be the method we use to make that determination. And this amendment does uh, that very thing. My amendment would direct the Science Advisory Board within the EPA to conduct a peer review to determine if a gas is, in fact, a pollutant following notification by the EPA administrator that he or she will be making such a determination on that gas. It further instructs that the Science Advisory Board to submit a written recommendation on that issue and directs the administrator to consider the written recommendation and consult with the Science Advisory Board before making that determination. And that's all it does. There's been some controversy here in the previous amendment about how we should be classifying greenhouse gases. Uh, but I don't think anybody um, um, can argue with the fact that science and good science needs to be used in order to make that determination. So that is my amendment. Uh, we're still passing out my amendment. Uh, and uh, I yield back. Rather than yield back uh, while members are looking at it, you'll yield to me. I, I agree with you. This should be uncontroversial. It clarifies the process by which EPA will consult with its science advisory board when designating new greenhouse gases. That science advisory board is a well-respected expert panel that reviews, consults with, and advises the agency on technical and scientific matters. And this amendment ensures that when EPA determines that a substance is a greenhouse gas, that the decision is well-founded and indisputable. So I would uh, join with you in support of this amendment. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barton. I hate to actually enthusiastically support an amendment because that probably poisons it in the eyes of uh, the majority. But in this case, I enthusiastically support it because I think it is a much improved um, substitution for that which it strikes. So I am very proud to say that I enthusiastically support it, and I hope that doesn't uh, spoil the deal for you. Are we ready for the uh, question on the amendment? All those in favor of the Hill Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment's agreed to. We. Um, no, I'm up. I'm going to do that one. Uh, yeah. Uh, we had uh, pending the uh, Stupak amendment and, on, uh, to Title III, and we asked it to be pulled back until we can get a ruling from the parliamentarian as to whether it is uh, germane to the bill. The parliamentarian advises us that because of the breadth of the bill, encompassing so many different titles, that this amendment would be germane. So therefore, the uh, point of order is uh, uh, overruled. Uh, the amendment is pending before us, and Mr. Stupak has given a, 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 an argument in favor of the amendment. 
Do we? Uh, does anyone seek um, to Mr. be Chairman. recognized in opposition? We'll go to Mr. Barton first, and then others will have a chance to speak. Well, first of all, Mr. Chairman, before I speak in opposition, I do want to compliment you on actually checking with the parliamentarian. I, I appreciate that. Uh, because of the scope of this bill, apparently, if EPA wanted to regulate ham sandwiches, that would also be germane to this bill. But having said that, let me um, get to the heart of this. My, I, first, I want to ask a question to the author, Mr. Stupak, because I know how hard he works as oversight chairman. This Section 359, do you intend it to apply to the CO2 market that this bill sets up, or is are you simply trying to get more authority for the natural gas market that the FERC definitely has authority in currently? Uh, the intent was to get to the carbon credit market because that was uh, basically it goes to carbon credit. It is both. So We're making it uniform across everything. So how how would you blend FERC's authority versus the EPA's authority? Because when you come to regulating the exchanges, it's going to be the Commodities Future Trade Commission and FERC, the Federal Energy. So you're not you're not worried about creating a conflicting regulatory entity problem? No, because I don't see EPA trading on the markets for carbon credits. Okay. And underneath the bill, um, FERC and them will set what allowances are allowed. We can release allowances in case there's spikes. So that's where FERC would have to, again, have to play a role along with the. Uh, I'm reclaiming my, thank you for answering my question, Mr. Stupak. I, I'm troubled that we're going to give new authority to an entity that has normally been in the wholesale market and the pipeline siting market and the electricity transmission siting market and interstate commerce. But setting that aside, I would call members' attention to uh, line 9 and 10. It gives the FERC the authority if they see that an entity may be violating, which would be present tense, may have violated past tense or may be about to violate future tense any provision of this act. This may be about to violate. The, if, you, if you take that to a common example, if a police officer thought we might be about to go past the speed limit, they could give us a ticket. I mean, I, I, that is very troubling that we're about to give the FERC the authority to go in and give these cease and desist orders based on their judgment or their intuition that somebody might be about to violate a provision of, the, of, of this, this act. So I'm I'm very troubled by this, and I would um, I would hope that we would, if not defeat the amendment, encourage the author to at least delete that phrase, may be about to violate, because that, to me, is a very troubling. Uh, would would gentlemen yield on that point? Be happy to. On, on 9 and 10, that is the same authority that the Commodities Future Trade Commission has right now and Securities Exchange Commission. That's what happened in Amrith. If you have to go prove your case in court, which takes a lot of time, then the assets they may have, like the $291 million fine that was levied on Amrith, they sold their assets off. There's nothing left. By the time the case is adjudicated, there's no assets to go after. So if you believe there's a violation, you go in and get a cease and desist. It's no different than any other court proceeding where you go in and get an injunction that you do not dispose the assets until the case is resolved. Well, so, so there's a due process clause in here because after that uh, order is put forth, you have 10 days to get to a judicial court, U.S. District Court, to lift that order if it's erroneously done. So there, there's due process there all the way along, and it's no different 
than what we've been doing for years under SEC and the CFTC. FERC never had this power. This is the power they asked for even when President Bush was, uh, Mr. Kelleher, I think his name was, uh, you, you, know, Mr. you know him pretty well, Mr. Barton. He, he was the guy who came and asked us for this. I don't authority. believe he asked for maybe about to violate, but I could be wrong. I just, I don't want a police officer coming in my home and arresting me because that officer thinks I may be about to violate some, some statute. But in order to arrest you, he has to have a warrant or some kind of review, and even in this case, there's a review provided. Okay. Well, my time's expired. The gentleman's time has expired. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank that my good friend, and really a good friend from Michigan, uh, on what he's trying to accomplish is a great goal. He wants to prevent market manipulation in the energy commodities market, and that's laudable, and I agree. Uh, my concern is solutions is too broad and gives much unchecked authority to Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that we don't know what they've, uh, that they have the capacity to do it. But briefly, the Stupak Amendment would greatly expand the authority of FERC to issue cease and desist order for any violation or threatened violation of any provision, Natural Gas Act, Nat Natural Gas Policy Act of 1978, and the Federal Power Act on its own motion without notice or a hearing without direct or immediate judicial review. FERC has existing authority for injunction authority um, that I would hope that we would at least let's see how they do that with this expanded authority we're giving them in this bill before we uh, give them this authority. The amendment also would empower FERC to freeze the assets of a company under investigation for violations of market manipulation rules also without notice or hearing or without direct immediate judicial review. For example, the amendment would allow FERC to issue a cease and desist order without notice and opportunity for a hearing unless the Commission determines that notice and hearing prior to entry would be impractical or contrary to public interest. The problem is the Commission itself makes that determination when to waive the notice and the opportunity for hearing requirement. Um, the amendment limits the opportunity for immediate judicial review of the Commission action which suggests that FERC could act without adequate judicial oversight. FERC has existing authority to ask a district judge for a TRO or temporary restraining order in situations, and I haven't heard anybody complain about their current authority is insufficient. And I don't disagree with the concept, and we tried to work out some language in the last 30 minutes, but, um, but we haven't been able to, and that's why I think this amendment is way over broad uh, for what we may be looking at. We're literally shooting in the dark, and those folks who don't understand it, you don't know what you're going to hit. And uh, that may be my, that's my concern about this amendment. And I, I'd like to continue to work. And in fact, I'll yield to my, my great friend uh, from the Upper Peninsula. Well, I, th I thank the gentleman. And, and, and you've always been a supporter of the Pump Act. And you've helped us with it. And you've been involved in all the hearings. Uh, the insufficiency, it, it's not insufficient. Because again, Commodities Future Trade Commission has this authority. SEC has this authority. The reason why it's insufficient, because FERC never had the authority. We're giving FERC the authority not only to do natural gas, but because we're creating a whole new market, the carbon credit market. Regular. I would rather, if we're going to create this whole new market, You're let's do it where we have robust regulation, Why don't we do not let the horse out of barn and try to put it back in after. <laughs> and for judicial review, if you go to page okay. four, 10 days after respondent Never. was served with a temporary cease and desist, they can go to a U.S. district court all the boat. And, and do it. So yeah. judicial review is there. Same authority CFTC has, SEC has, FERC's never had it. They've asked for it. We're creating a new market. Let's have regulation and oversight over the new market so we don't create a nightmare like we've seen in the financial markets with energy. And, and that's the reason why we need this amendment. And uh, I'll continue well, to work with the gentleman. If there's some accommodating language we can find in looking at CFTC and also SEC, language. I'm, I'm happy to do so, but this is pretty much pattern after it now. I reclaim my time, and FERC has existing injunctive relief authority under Section 20 of the uh, NGA, Natural Gas Act, Section 504 of the NGPA, and Section 314 of the Federal Power Act for all violations of these statutes, and there's no reason why this existing authority, which the Commission has rarely used, is inadequate now. And that's my concern about the amendment. And, uh, and again, I'll if you yield, I, I don't disagree with you, but it's after the fact. You have to go through the litigation. You have to find a violation. Then you can go after it. What we're saying is if there's a violation, stop it. Freeze it. Stop the action so we can protect the ratepayers 
and the U.S. taxpayers. Then, if there's violations, then at least we have some assets to go after. Amrith, $6 billion. What do we get for it? $291 million fine. What do we get? Nothing. They dispose, dispose of all the assets during the litigation. Well, I run out of time, I'm, Mr. Chairman, but if my colleague would, well, he's already used his time, but uh, again, the person is violating or has violated any of the provisions of the act, the, there's already a current statute on that. But I, the gentleman's time has expired. Are there any other members seeking recognition? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And strike uh, the word, last word. Um, I sort of feel like uh, Mr. Green from Texas, uh, what he indicated, that he has some apprehension about this because it's so comprehensive. You know, Mr. Chairman, this is an example where we should have had a hearing on this. Uh, Mr. Stupak and I have talked before about the lack of regulation and the worrying about this new market and what this means and the possibility that there will be no regulation of this new market, which will have the same problem that we've seen in other markets uh, weak. But I, I think what the gentleman from Texas is saying, it's so encompassing. And here we are in a hearing at 11 o'clock at night trying to put in place a structure which is so encompassing that a lot of us are a little concerned. And I think it would be worthwhile to have a hearing to get it right. Because this new market, Mr. Stupak, you're talking about, it says if the Commission finds that any entity may be violating, may have violated, or may be about to violate, about to violate any provisions of this Act. Now, this Act is a 1,000 pages. Well, I guess this, this applies to the Natural Gas Act. Okay, to violate any provision of this Act or, or any rule, any regulation, any restriction, any condition. So if you violate any condition, I mean, that seems, I don't know where you got this language. Maybe this is standard legal. Uh, language that's used in this kind of thing, but for them to come after you a cease and desist order based upon any condition, any regulation, or any restriction, an order imposed a cease and desist, it's just a little bit uh, overwhelming, I think, for a person just to suddenly get this and to read it. The question I might have to ask you, describe to me if a person is violating this Natural Gas Act through a restriction or a condition. What is the process for him to get a hearing on this? Now, I see in here that there is a hearing, but is this hearing after the cease and desist order? So if the guy is hanging out there, losing money, going into bankruptcy while he's trying to put himself forward, to fight this cease and desist order. So I guess just take me briefly through, uh, Bart, how a person, if my corporation violated a condition of the act, how would I suddenly stop and have a hearing so that I would not go into bankruptcy? Sure. Let's take Amrith. Amrith was trading on New York Exchange, Mercantile Exchange. They got too big. They exceeded their position limits, OK? So NYMEX went to him and said, you're too big, you got too much position, you can manip manipulate this market. And they said, fine, we'll leave your market, we're going to ICE, Intercontinental Exchange, because you can't see what we're doing. Right then and there, they knew Amrith was violating the law, and they asked them not to do it. So they said, we're going to do it anyways, we'll take our marbles and go elsewhere and they cornered 75% of market. So here's what you could have done if you had cease and desist, but FERC doesn't have that authority. They could have said to Amrith, here's your cease and desist order. You're too big, draw down. And now you have 10 days. This is temporary cease and desist order. We go to court. Do I have merit as NYMEX to enforce the position limit on NYMEX, on, on, on Amrith, because you've gotten too big? You have 10 days in which you go to court and lift that order if it's not there. So if I put an order, I slap an order on you saying cease and desist, stop trading, you're too big, you're violating the exchange rules, and therefore you then have a judicial review. It's no different than what Commodities Future Trade Commission has, Securities Exchange Commission that had for years. 
FERC has asked for this authority. I've not created something new or different. Now what you're saying, you took then what the Commodities Future Trading has. Commodities Future Trade Commission has. And the SEC has. Right. And but that's regulated exchanges. Yeah. We've created these dark markets, ICE, Dubai. They're dark markets. So you've just taken that language that these two agencies has and overlaid it. Correct. Under the, uh, for the Natural Gas Act, and you're making. And to the carbon markets, and a new emerging market that we don't know yet about. And is this identical to what is in the Commodities Exchange and the SEC? Pretty much so, yes. We've worked with FERC. This can is I the ask, language they wanted. Can I ask counsel to confirm sure. that? Um, this might be a little difficult qu question for you, but uh, Mr. Stupak is saying that the language he has in this bill is almost identical to what the SEC has in dealing with stocks and equities and what the commodity future has. It's closer to SEC than the F F C F T C. It's closer to SEC. Are we looking at in his amendment? The gentleman's time has expired. The council will answer the gentleman's question. <coughs> with respect to the Commodity Exchange Act, there is a provision, Section 6C, uh, which reads, whenever it shall appear to be to the Commission that any registered entity or other person has engaged, is engaging, or is about to engage in any act or practice constituting a violation of any provision of this act or any rule, regulation, or order thereunder, or is restraining trade trading in any commodity for future delivery, the Commission may bring an action in the proper district court. And it continues. Okay, gentlemen. Uh, we'll, maybe you could get another member to yield, but uh, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle. I much enjoyed the discussion between my two good friends and colleagues here, and there's a measure of right in each, and I'd, I'd, I'd like the attention to counsel. First of all, cease and desist orders are not new, are they? I don't believe so, sir. And cease and desist orders may be issued before a hearing, but they must be followed by a hearing before the agency issuing them at the earliest time. Isn't that so? Give me one moment to consult the language. Well, supposing, supposing you take my word for it, because under the federal rules, that's, <laughs> that, has, that has to be done. Uh, now, having, having said that, the, the, if, if you don't have authority to issue cease and desist, you have to go the injunctive route. Now, the injunctive route requires the uh, agency to uh, go, go to court. That can take a significant amount of time. Uh, isn't that right? Yes, yes or no? They're going to court. Okay. So now we've got this, this problem. It takes a goodly while if you don't have the authority to issue the cease and desist. Cease and desist order can be, uh, can, can, can be issued by the agency, but it's got to be followed by a hearing at the earliest moment. If, if the issuance was Im improper, uh, it, it, it can be lifted on application to the commission. Isn't that right? That's correct. And, and so when that happens, uh, th they've got to do that, and, and the person who feels he's been wronged by the wrongful issuance of the order has a right to get a hearing at that point, doesn't he? Yes, uh, either before the commission or there is also a judicial review provision. Now, one of the reasons for the cease and desist order is that in this wonderful new world of ours, money can move with the speed of light. With electronic transfers, all of a sudden, the account is emptied, and, and Mr. Madoff, or whoever the rascal might happen to be, is headed for some interesting place with whom we don't have uh, uh, a treaty uh, enabling us to get him back. Uh, no extradition treaty. So the argument for the cease and desist is that it gives you a quick way of getting at him. But it, it is a way of, of getting at the wrongdoer without uh, doing it in a way which denies that wrongdoer, if he in fact is a wrongdoer, the opportunity to go into court and uh, to go into court or to go to the agency and say, 
this is wrong. Isn't that right? I'm not sure I can uh, speak to the the intent of the provision, but okay. And and so, uh, if 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 he if 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 he doesn't like what the agency does, he can get into court very quickly for a TRO, a temporary restraining order. Isn't that right? Yes. So you, we don't need to be worried about. Uh, the the fact that that by the issuance of the cease and desist, there's going to be any cal immediate calamity befalling uh, the uh, alleged wrongdoer who is the victim of the uh, if if in fact he is a victim or the defendant of the uh, cease and disorder uh, cease and desist order. He can go into court if he need to to. Uh, get that done even if the agency won't do it. So he has two options to address. One is to go to court to get the, uh, or rather one is to go to the agency to get the cease and desist lifted, and one of which is to go uh, to a, a court if they have not done so. Isn't that right? That's correct, sir. So you have here then the responsibility of evaluating uh, where, where you, how you protect uh, the interests of a person who might be hurt. The recipient of the cease and desist order can go either back to the agency or he can go to a court and get it lifted. Uh, this, uh, the cease and desist order is a much more expeditious way of addressing the matter than going to into court for a uh, for an injunction, isn't that right? I don't have specific information about the relative timing of those two percent. So now we have ourselves then in a situation where the, it, it is it becomes useful to afford the agency the right to do this because they can't do it without a hearing, and if they play games with it, they're going to wind up in court. Isn't that right? Could you repeat the question? Well. And I'm running out of time here. Uh, if if the agency is is careless with the issuance of the cease and desist, first of all, they they can't do it without giving a hearing, and second of all, they're subject to judicial review. Isn't that right? That's correct, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, gentleman's time has expired. Will the gentleman yield just the rest of his time? Uh, gentleman's time has oh, expired. Uh, the gentleman from Texas. Uh, uh, the ranking member has indicated that he believes it is time for us to have a vote. And I know that there are members on well, both I sides that seek to be recognized. Um, but I think that uh, the gentleman is giving us good advice. There are other amendments that are pending, and the next one comes from the minority side. Uh, I apologize to all of uh, the members who are here uh, who I know want to speak on this amendment. But I think it's it's time for us to go to the vote. Um, all those in favor of the Stupac um, amendment, uh, signify by the sign of aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. No. no. Uh, the ayes have it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd like a roll call vote. A roll call is called. The clerk will rule, roll, uh, will uh, call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Aye. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Markey votes aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Says she votes aye. Mr. Stupak. Yes. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Get. Mr. Get votes aye. Mrs. Capps.
Caps votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. No. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. No. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. No. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Shattuck. No. Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer. No. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bono Mac. Ms. Bono Mac, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murray of, Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess votes no. Ms. Blackburn. No. Ms. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Gingry. No. Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scully. No. Mrs. Mr. Scalise, no. Yeah, again. Yeah. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Doyle, aye. Mr. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel, aye. <laughs> Mr. Pallone. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Have uh, have all members? Mr. M oh, Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson votes no. Have all members been recorded?
I just might ask that Mr. Barton is uh, conferring with Mr. Waxman, and I don't know what the margin of the vote is, but if it's within one or two, he may want to escape that back room where you have him kidnapped, bound and gagged. Who are you talking about? Mr. Barton is on your side over there. <laughs> it's not the can first you, time. Can you, <laughs> can you get Mr. Barton to vote? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we didn't give you enough, Mr. Green. <laughs> Is there another allocation over there that you're still working to? That'll be on Not recorded, Mr. Chairman. Well, in that, in that case, in that case, oh, I apologize. He is. He he must have ducked in. When I all I can remember was Mr. 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 Barton. Not recorded, Mr. Barton. Okay, Mr. Mr. Barton votes no. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 33 and the nays were 20. The Stupak uh, amendment is adopted. Are there any other amendments? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingrey. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Ms. Ms. Congressman, is it number five or eight? It's number eight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's it, number eight. eight. Does he want to? Uh, uh, we, uh, ask the clerk to report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Gingri. In section 321, section 782 is amended to read as follows. Section 782, proceeds from auctions of allowances. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Today our economic prospects are grim. Uh, United States jobless rate is currently at 8.9 percent and rising. State budgets are reeling as more and more Americans seek government assistance programs. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, the underlying legislation will only further complicate our economic troubles, particularly with the enactment of such a confusing and inequitable allowance allocation. This allowance scheme will essentially take money out of the pockets of every single energy consumer and redistribute those dollars in the form of allowances to businesses. Accordingly, my amendment requires that 100 percent of emission allowances be auctioned off by the administrator and that the proceeds be returned to the state in which, in which the covered entity is located. Mr. Chairman, governors then would be able to use the funds to assist consumers, workers, and businesses in their own states to help fund research and development. And most importantly, the amendment ensures that there are no free allowances for federal government bureaucrats to squander on backroom deals. Mr. Chairman, auction and emission allowances is the most efficient way to set market prices and it bars the giving of handouts to those that were 
first to beat a path to Congress. Testifying before the Budget Committee in March, even Budget Director Peter Orzag supported auction and emission allowance when he said this, if you don't auction the permits, it would represent the largest corporate welfare program that has ever been enacted in the history of the United States. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the approach outlined in this amendment is consistent with what President Obama proposed in his own budget. It is with this spirit of true bipartisanship that I ask my colleagues to support the amendment before them. And I, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the gentleman's time has expired. Does anyone seek recognition? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Thank you very much, and that's exactly the point. I'm from Texas. The only question I have is, if Texas accepted the money and then we secede it, would we be able to keep it? We would double it. Right. Gentlemen's, uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Are there any other members seeking uh, recognition? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Briefly, in support of the Gingrey Amendment, <clears throat> I'm not sure what he said, so I don't want to repeat too If I hope I don't repeat it, but the Obama administration initial proposal on climate change was 100% auction. And those of you that most believe that this is a serious, serious problem, this evening, and I'm a noted skeptic in that arena, but if you think it is, the best way to quickly address it is to require that every allowance be auctioned. That's fair, treats everybody in the economy that uses products that create CO2 the same. After the Gingrey vote, they're going to cost you. If you want to try to rebate the proceeds in various uh, ways to alleviate. <laughs> Uh, the obvious pain that those on our side believe you're going to have if you go into this arena. Uh, you might want to, I'm not sure how uh, Mr. Gingrey's amendment handles the, handles the uh, proceeds of the auction. I, I, at one time it was all rebated back to the states. Yeah, if, if the gentleman will yield, uh, that is exactly right. It would, wherever the, the, the money came from, it would go back to those states and the governor would, would decide how it would be done. So we, we, we've set it up to be revenue neutral, uh, but at least in the initial stage you would, get, you would get a fair distribution based on the market of who most valued uh, the allowances for CO2. So I'm, I, um, I believe that this would be, a, if you're the truest of true believers, then you should support the Gingry Amendment. And with that, I would yield back the balance of my time. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are there other members seeking recognition? The chair will recognize himself. Uh, I rise in opposition to the Gingri Amendment, and uh, I understand the uh, intent of the uh, gentleman, and eventually I think we will reach a point where 100 percent of the allowances are auctioned. Um, but as we have discussed throughout the course uh, of this week, um, there have uh, been negotiations uh, that have taken place that deal with the transition uh, from the era in which we're living to the uh, era which will occur when we're fully within the no carbon, low carbon era. And towards that goal, 15% uh, of the allowances have been apportioned for the trade sensitive, energy intensive industries in our country, uh, such as steel and aluminum uh, and uh, cement and paper, uh, so that they are not exploited uh, by uh, the Chinese or the Indians or others uh, in a global competitive marketplace. We think that's necessary, uh, and we've worked with those industries to ensure uh, that they are given uh, the tools that are necessary. Uh, to be able to make a successful transition. In addition, 35% uh, of the allowances are set aside uh, so that we can deal with uh, the impact of higher electricity rates uh, upon the consumers in our country. Uh, and that formula is in place as well during a transition period in order to make sure that the utility industry can make the transition, uh, but at the same time the consumers are 
uh, protected from severe adverse consequences. Now, the same is also true uh, for natural gas and for uh, home heating oil, um, so that in each one of those areas we have thought through ways in which uh, ordinary families are protected. So while I understand uh, the intent of the, gen of the gentleman, and I think eventually we will reach that point where 100 percent are auctioned off, uh, at this time uh, it just would be too disruptive to the uh, trade uh, affected uh, industries and to the consumers in the United States. Uh, I urge uh, and I will, vote. The will the chairman yield? Uh, I'll be glad to yield. Uh, and I appreciate the gentleman yielding. I, and, and let me just say briefly that uh, it, to me, uh, all of the machinations that have gone on in the last uh, several weeks in regard to these allowances, uh, Mr. Chairman, it, it smacks a lot of the earmark process. Uh, and I know how we are on both sides of the, the aisle. Uh, would like to see a, a fair uh, approach to that and realize that there's uh, uh, real opportunities for uh, mischief uh, in that process. And, I, you know, the same thing here. I think that this amendment, like, uh, like uh, uh, Ranking Member Barton was saying, is, would guarantee absolute fairness and everybody would have uh, an equal bite at the apple and, and it wouldn't be just those who maybe have an opportunity to be uh, a little bit more accessible to members of Congress. So with that, uh, uh, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for, for yielding me the time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, again, um, uh, Mr. Doyle and Mr. Inslee did an excellent job in negotiating with the steel and other industries. Mr. Boucher did an excellent job in negotiating with the uh, utility uh, industry. These benefits are less earmarks than they are more generic protections for industries uh, across our economy uh, as they are for consumers across our economy. And, uh, and that's really the intent. But over time we uh, have as the full intention of the legislation that we move to a market-based um, uh, system uh, in its entirety. But it will take some time. So in conclusion, I urge a no vote on the Gingrey Amendment. It would uh, un unbalance uh, something that has been very carefully constructed, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, are there other members seeking recognition on the Gingrey Amendment? Seeing none, the vote then comes on that amendment. Uh, all those in favor signify by the sign of aye. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like a recorded vote. Uh, the gentleman has asked for a recorded vote. Uh, the clerk will uh, uh, call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Mr. Rush. Oh, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. No. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. 
Mr. Melanson. No. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. Oh, no. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill. No. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. No. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. No. Mr. Murphy votes no. <coughs> Mr. Space. No. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. <coughs> Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Barton. Aye. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Upton. No. Mr. Upton votes no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns votes no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. No. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer. Pass. Mr. Boyer passes. Mr. Radonovich. Yes. Mr. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Yes. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. No. Ms. Bono Mack, no. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes no. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Burgess. Ms. Blackburn. No. Ms. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Gingry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scullies. No. Mr. Scullies votes no. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Who seeks Mr. Boyer. Uh, over here. Off on pass. I need to change my Mr. Boyer votes off on pass and on I. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Waxman. I vote uh, no. How am I recorded? Mr. I want to change from uh, yes Mr. to no, please. Mr. Radonovich is recorded as voting aye. Off uh, aye on no? Oh, it's no. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Chairman, as soon as the vote's announced, could I be recognized to make an announcement? Yes. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Clerk will tally the vote. It's not going to be pretty. Miss <laughs> Gingrey's oh. bill? Yes. Most not so, so I'm not going to advise you. Is, is Mr. Sullivan recorded? 
Mr. Sullivan votes no. Yeah. As you're Where'd you hear that? Looks like you heard You fell down the stairs? Clerk will announce the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were four, the nays were 52. Four ayes, 52. Four ayes and 52 noes. And that was a roll call vote. Uh, the, uh, uh, the noes have it. <laughs> the ayes got cream. There's no question about it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can Mr. I be recognized? Mr. Barton's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I would ask just all. Just a minute. Let's get the committee to order. Mr. Chairman, I would ask all Republican members to convene immediately uh, in the uh, Republican lounge for a caucus about tomorrow's schedule. <laughs> so. I, I would rather not, because I, I want to break it to my side gently. Okay, turn up your mic. Uh, the Republican members are going into a, a meeting, and we're going to adjourn for the evening. We will come back tomorrow at 10. The House is going to be finished with its business in late afternoon, and it would be my hope and expectation that we will get to the end of this bill uh, an hour after the House is finished with its business tomorrow. So uh, that, that, with that uh, information, uh, I want to wish you all a good evening, a restful sleep, and we'll uh, see everybody tomorrow morning at 10. And I'd like to ask everybody to get here on time so if we have a lot of work to do, we can process that work. The House Energy and Commerce Committee continues to consider amendments to the Energy and Climate Bill tomorrow. You can see that live on C-SPAN 3 at 10 a.m. Eastern. You're watching public affairs programming on C-SPAN 2, created by America's cable TV companies, offered as a public service. In a few moments, Senate debate on the status of the detainee facility at Guantanamo Bay. In about two hours, 